Racing in February. Of course, we're in Florida. Homestead Miami Speedway hosts the Rolex Sports Car Series next. In just one year, the Daytona prototype field has gone from this to this. The growth of the category has been explosive, and it's not stopping yet. Today at Homestead, there are four times the number of DPs compared to last year, and four times a tougher field. At the top of that list is reigning Rolex Series champion Terry Borchella. The Bell Motorsports team is still on a high after its dramatic victory at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. The threats to Borchella's crown are many and varied, and they're not holding back. The high-powered Chip Ganassi Racing Organization adds another car to its arsenal, while Andy Wallace seeks revenge for a defeat that could so easily have been a victory. Four times the cars, four times the intensity, four times the fun. Round two of the Rolex Sports Car Series is next. The sports car season kicked off one month ago with the historic Rolex 24 at Daytona. Now with that torture test out of the way, it's time to go sprint racing. Hello everyone, I'm Lee Diffie along with Dorsey Schrader and welcome to the Grand Prix of Miami Round 2 of the Rolex Sports Car Series here at Homestead Miami Speedway. Well as you just heard in the show's tease there, a great field here today, 18 Daytona prototypes and Dorsey four of those new entries to this class. We've got a great field here today, what kind of challenges do they face? Well the first thing is a brand new Homestead, it's been completely reconfigured and with its 20 degree high banks there are some concerns about tire temperature, tire wear. The second thing is the field itself, some 42 cars and three different different classes, different speeds, all going to be waging war today in very tight confines. There's going to be traffic problems. Great build up to this event. A lot of excitement surrounding it. We're looking forward to it. It should be a great race. Before we go racing, let's meet some of the key players. The field today will be led to green by an all-star lineup here on the front row. Chip Ganassi Racing really laid the gauntlet down this year when they put Scott Pruitt and Max Pappas in the same machine, and it was Scott Pruitt who claimed his second pole position of the year here yesterday. On the outside of the front row, we have 2002 driver champion Didier Tays, and he'll be joined by none other than, two, than uh, sports car sensation Jan Magnussen. For the level playing field here in Grandam has allowed a lot of new teams to make an immediate impression, none more so than Mike Shank Racing. They sit third on the grid, the car driven by Osvaldo Negri Jr. He'll be joined by Bert Frizzell. Expect them to make a move today. Now there's 18 Daytona prototypes in the field. The battle is on. Well, the rain dampened a lot of people's spirits during the 12-hour, the 24-hour Rolex of Daytona, but probably no group more than the guys from Prototype Technology Group. They brought two very strong BMW M3s to that event, but early in the race, actually just a few laps in, the 21 car suffered electrical problems. Not long after that, the team car, the number 22 car, suffered its own problems, and it seemed like whatever could go wrong did go wrong. A lot of disappointed fans left Daytona. Neither BMW saw the checkered flag. If they're going to win here today, they've qualified on the pole, but they're going to have to overcome a very strong contingent of Porsches that have qualified second and third. Billy Oberlin and Boris Setter on the pole, but Ian James has qualified his number 66 Porsche second and number 44 car. The winner from the GT class sits third. Strong competition. SGS Championship contending team Osco Motorsports had a diabolical start to their season at Daytona, crashing two of their three Porsches. However, team lead drivers David Murray and Craig Stanton came into Homestead and grabbed that pole in SGS. But due to a rules infraction, they have to start at the back today. The problem is a rear wing end plate on the tail of the car. This end plate is illegal and was 150,000 too tall. That both drivers claim it did not improve the performance of the car, but Grand Am has stood firm and said you will start in the back. Both Stanton and Murray are talented drivers. The 16 is quick. They are going to be coming through the field today here at Homestead. Time to squeeze in a quick break before we go racing here at Homestead. This is round two of the Rolex Sports Car Series. When we come back, we'll introduce you to the grid and go racing. The Rolex Sports Car Series is brought to you by Axiom, the global leader in customer information management solutions. Let Axiom help you grow great relationships with your customers. And by TGI Fridays. Right now, enjoy two eat for $19.99. It's good times, great food, and one amazing deal. 
Welcome back to Homestead Miami Speedway. A beautiful day here in Southern Florida as we prepare for the second round of the Rolex Sports Car Series. The teams, the competitors have had one month to prepare, to prepare for this second round. And it's great to see an increased field from 17 to 18 Daytona prototypes. We've got 11 GT cars and 13 SGS cars. And let's have a look at how they will line up for this second round. An amazing performance by Scott Pruitt. Back-to-back -back pole position. Sensational stuff for the Chip Ganassi Racing pilot and Didier Tay starting right alongside him. Oswaldo Negri, boy, oh boy, has he created some headlines this weekend, starting from the second row. Team with young Bert Frizzell will tell you lots more about those guys. And great to see the Brumos team up there. They've experienced some problems early this year, but David Donahue put it outside the second row. From position five, Jimmy Morales, Luis Diaz, the two Mexicans, and then Wayne Taylor, Max Angelelli, watch from them, starting from position six. Back to the fourth row, and it's a new car. Court Wagner and Kelly Collins, again, the injured Brent Martini will not start this one. Then Jack Baldwin, Shane Lewis did a great job in qualifying their spirits are high. Position nine, Stefan Gregoire in the spirit of Daytona racing. Crawford, watch for those guys. An improved performance from Daytona coming up. And another new car is the Hall Huang entry. Chris Hall, Larry Huang for that Silverstone Racing Services Daytona prototype. JC France qualified the car for he and Hurley Hayward. They start from 11-12 is Mike Borkowski. We roll through the remaining positions on the grid and look out for the other class pole sitters, Boris said, and the SGS class pole sitter, Greg Wilkins and Dave Lacey. They did a wonderful job and congratulations to them. That's their first pole position. Dorsey, what can we expect today? A war, I'll tell you what. Qualifying was so close. Scott Pruitt with a pretty good three or four or five, ten seconds. But second, third, and fourth place, identical to the tenth of a second. They're identical times. This is going to be a fantastic race. Well, we certainly have the weather for it, that's for sure. And it looked like one car going behind the wall already. So problems there. It looked from a distance to be one of the PTG BMWs. I hope it wasn't. Because they have been running very strong this weekend. And I can confirm that it wasn't one of the PTG BMWs because both have just gone by, so that's great news. And we prepare, yeah, we prepare. But this car out in front has been incredibly fast. Didier Tays and Jan Magnussen, as you heard Calvin mention earlier, great to have Jan in the Daytona pro prototype category. He has adapted very quickly and has been fast. But let's check out the race analysis here today. 42 cars in the field, and it's 109 laps or 2 hours, 45 minutes, whichever comes first. What do you think it's going to be? Well, I don't know. You know, it depends on if these guys can keep it clean. I doubt it very sincerely because they're going to bang into each other quite a bit. All three classes way under the track record. The deep, uh, prototype cars, three and a half seconds quicker. And, of course, that's because of this track. Like I said, recently reconfigured. It's not the same old homestead. In fact, it's a quite quick one now. Working our way towards the green flag before we get there, let's take a look at the Lexus track map. Well, the banking itself gives you a lot of speed, but you got to get rid of it going into turn one, two, and three. Plus, you lose the banking. It's flat there. Where you want to look at right here, breaking zone, turn six. That's going to be a good overtaking place. A bottleneck always here in nine, but up here in the, in the banking, at the bottom, 10 degrees, in the middle of the track, 20, I'm sorry, 15, and at the very top up here, 20 degrees of banking, the cars will be four wide. They'll use every bit of that bank. As we take a look now at the car that clinched the victory in the Rolex 24 at Daytona, there is Forrest Barber behind the wheel of the Kodak Easy Share Bell Motorsports Daytona prototype. These guys have been struggling, and yes, you are reading that graphic correctly, starting 14th. They have had a whole host of problems this weekend, and we will have updates on that situation with more. Forrest qualified the car, that's why he is in it. He is starting, that is a Grand American Road Racing Association rule. All 42 cars on the grid as they pack up and we work our way towards green. This time last year, there were only 16 cars in total. And we have got more than that now in just Daytona prototypes, which is wonderful and we should have an exciting race on our hands here at Homestead Miami Speedway. Who will win? That is the big question. Will we have a new winner? It's an all Lexus front row. Will Lexus get their first victory? We are racing here at Homestead Miami Speedway and watched them jump for positions. Forrest Barber pulled out of the line and already Oswaldo Negri ducks up the inside and Jimmy Morales a good start as well. 
up here in turn three, it's really tight. That's where everybody's got to get it sorted out. You see Scott Pruitt right now negotiating that corner. Watch for the stack up in here. There we see it, locked up break. And there is Didier Taze running third at the moment, just ahead of Jimmy Morales. Morales has made a wonderful start, but it's Scott Pruitt for Chip Ganassi Racing out in front. That Lexus-powered Riley leads the Lexus-powered Doran. Two Lexus-powered Dorans, then the second Ganassi car. Then it's David Donoghue and Court Wagner in the new GNW Motorsports. And the 54 has spun. Wow, so, wow, a rough start for, uh, for Forrest Barber. They've had a real rough weekend, gone through a couple of motor changes already, but this is an off-track excursion on lap one. As he regroups and gets it back on track, we go back up front. It's Scott Pruitt, leads Oswaldo Negri. We'll tell you more about the Michael Shank racing situation because they have really been impressive this weekend. And here already you see Jimmy Morales hassling Didier Taze. Let's take a look at what happened to the 54, center of your screen. Looks like he just gets in there a little bit by himself, gets on the throttle too hard, and around she comes and backs into the wall, which could have been avoided, I'll tell you that much. Whether there's any damage on that rear left side, it's hard to tell at the moment. He just didn't lock up the brakes and uh, went ahead and drove backwards. Here's your onboard. Watch right here. Gets on the throttle. You hear it break loose, I think. Yep, just too much throttle on cold tires. And here, instead of locking the brakes down, he lets it continue rolling into the wall. Maybe not much, but didn't need to happen. And look at this already. Oswaldo Negri, Aussie as we call him, is pressuring Scott Pruitt in the early running of this race. It's very early days. If you've just joined us, this is a two hour 45 race or 109 laps around this 2.21 mile circuit here at Homestead Miami Speedway. Donahue early. He raced fantastic last year at this circuit with Tommy Riggins. The DP and the GTS car had a wonderful fight here before the Heritage Mustang went out. And it's great to see Donahue up there after a terrible time at the Rolex 24. Well, Oswaldo Negri might not be a household name in racing yet, but let me tell you something, folks. He's going to get there. Awful good qualifying job. Now he's pressured no other than Scott Pruitt, who's got a lot of experience. As he comes around, on to the front straight. Let's find out more from the 54. Cal. Jim Bell, this has been anything but a smooth weekend for you. And Forrest immediately in trouble. What did he say about the car? Um, actually, he didn't say anything about the car. He, got, he fell off in three. I think even the tires were up. I really don't know, though. He didn't say anything other than he was off. He's, he's OK. And he's back out there now. Well, the heating problems again early in the weekend. And then Terry said this morning he wasn't really happy with the handling. Have you made some changes for the race today? Uh, uh, yeah, we lost, lost our race in early on in the weekend, weekend and so, so we've been, been behind the curve all weekend. weekend. We made quite a few changes, and also in the cooling, I hope we'll be all right. I just, I just need to stay on that lead lap and try to get Terry Borchella back in. in. Remember, he's undefeated this year. He won both, both the Grand Am Cup and the Rolex, Rolex at the 24. And boy, will he be fired up when he gets behind the wheel of that Kodak Easy Share. Pontiac powered Doran. When we rode, rode on board with him, that just showed you on the banking how tight it could become. He was much quicker than the Porsche that he was trying to pass, but you heard him get out of the throttle because he wasn't sure that the driver of the Porsche knew he was going to try to get underneath him there. That's the thing we're going to start seeing as this race progresses. So Forrest Barber working his way back up as he comes up on the 47 machine. As we go back up front, race leading car, it is the 01 Comp USA Lexus powered Riley for Scott Pruitt as he has about a one and a half second gap over Oswaldo Negri for Michael Shank Racing. Another Lexus powered car, but a Doran chassis. In fact, the top three are Lexus powered cars at the moment. Scott Pruitt qualified and is running on soft compound tires, whereas Negri is on a harder compound. Now, the further they go green, Negri's car should come up to the front. Uh, there are some concerns about the soft tire not making it through a full two speed been impressed with Jimmy Morales in these early stages. He's chasing Taze and holding David Donahue at bay. We're up to speed and we're away here at Homestead Miami. We're going to take a quick break but rejoin us on the other side of this for so much more. Welcome back. You're watching Speed Channel's coverage of round two of the Rolex Sports Car Series here at Homestead in Florida. You ride with David Donahue. And we jump right into the middle of the battle for fourth. Didier Taze just up ahead. Jimmy Morales has managed to get by Didier Taze. They come through the GT and SGS cars. And Morales has done some good work. Done really good work. And you see right there again, traffic is going to be a factor. Uh, had to wait up on the Porsche just a little bit to make sure that the driver saw it was coming underneath. It cost him a couple three tenths. 
Is this, the big question has to be asked, is this going to be Lexus? It's their time. Top four cars, the Lexus powered machines already. Then we have the Porsche power plant for David Donahue. The Lexus power plant has been strong this weekend, no doubt about that. Well, I would be in my second race uh, for Lexus a little bit cautious about showing so much speed because they certainly uh, can give an address that issue of a restrictor and, and slow that down if it becomes too much power against these other mates. And Oswaldo Negri has fallen back into the uh, clutches of Jimmy Morales, who continues to go from strength to strength. Both Ganassi cars showing very well in the early stages. And here's Morales now on Negri already as they come up into some of the cars at the back of this field. The slower GT and SGS cars. And look at this, it's Ganassi versus Michael Shank racing. And it's only a matter of time now before Morales makes his move. He might go up the middle here. I don't think so, though. I think he's going to ride it out. Up ahead of him is a hairpin coming up. And this is where you can really get bottlenecked in. Both through cleanly as the Porsche driver gets out of the way. It was a nice gentleman. Thing to do. Now he pulls out. He's got the inside run. It's Lexus on Lexus here. The only difference is the chassis. They almost touch. Jimmy Morales on Oswaldo Negri. Nice move and plenty of power. <laughs> that was just a hip check. Said, hey, now I'm up here. So Lots it's of power. Ganassi cars one and two at the moment. Scott Pruitt leads Jimmy Morales, then Oswaldo Negri. Didier Tays for Doran Lister Racing runs fourth. David Donahue, then Court Wagner. And what you have to remember about that sixth place car, it's a brand new car. This is their first event. Morales just got down in turn one, crashed over the curbing quite hard, put the car airborne actually. And as I saw him on the banking also after he made the pass, drop his left wheels below the apron. That's six degrees versus 10. That can hurt the car. Brian, what do you have for us? Well, guys, the six car, he's run all weekend long on the harder compound tires. And one of the things that we thought was that they would get used to running on those. And they actually showed amazing speed in qualifying by doing that. So did Morales in the 02 car. Pruitt in the 01 car started on softer compound tires. It's been kind of amazing. They had to go to harder compound tires for these long durations under green. And the balance of that car has changed. In the softer compound, he has more grip up front. In the harder compound, he has more grip in the back. So he's had to make a lot of adjustments in that car. Let's get down with Calvin Fish. Well, Brian, we talked about that qualifying performance of Osvaldo Negri here as they put in the car third on the grid. What made it more impressive was he was on the harder of the two Goodyear compounds, the 480. This team been running all weekend long, and with much higher ambient temperatures today, they are used to running the car on this tyre. They should have a good balance for this long stint. There is just over 20 seconds separating race leader Scott Pruitt and up the road, the 54, the championship leading car of Forrest Barber. So Forrest really has to push hard, try not to go a lap down because this man is on a charge. This is what you don't want to see. You don't want to see a gaggle of Porsches in front of you when you get to the infield because if it gets stuck behind them, it can cost you some 10 seconds on that whole infield run through. Scott clean by, all, well, not clean by as they chop right down on him, by golly. And these are the two of the front runners. These are two of the hot cars in the SGS. We ride with the 16. This is Dave Murray, and up ahead is the Doncaster Porsche. These are two of the front running SGS cars, and boy, oh boy, have we got some great cat cars in that category. The Super Grand Sport Field, this combination, Dave Murray, Craig Stanton for Arsco Motorsports, Jean-Francois Dumoulin and Robert Julian, the two guys who dominated with Greg Putmans and Mark Lieb in their class at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. And you have to remember that the 16, that car there started at the back of the field. So they're flying. Yes, they are. And they don't have to get out of the way of the prototypes just because the prototype is quicker. They are racing it within their own class, like I said, at the beginning. And they have every right to every inch of piece of the race track that they use. They're flying. There, now, again, do you, see, do you see the curb usage? Now it's time for Morales to negotiate his way by. We ride again with the Asco Porsche. There's Morales. Morales really, really banging the curbs when he went through one again. He launched the car off of them. That's like, in a fighter, it's like taking body punches. It weakens the front suspension, the back suspension, and they can fail, as we saw in the 24. Although this is a sprint race, and he's going for it. There goes Oswaldo Negri. Here come the DPs. And this is what it's like for the SGS and GT competitors when the big boys come storming through. And that's a good example right there. It's not just one, it's a whole gaggle of them 
that have them trapped to the outside right now. Have a look at this. Here comes Wayne Taylor and Shane Lewis. This is fantastic. This is the race we were banking on. Look at Taylor. Oh, Inside, there's contact with Shane Lewis and the Doncaster Porsche, and Wayne Taylor was the big winner there. Wayne Taylor had a terrible qualifying. They had a lot of understeer in the car. He just couldn't get it to turn. They fixed it this morning. Was quickest in the last session this morning before the race. He's on the move. Wow, Robert Julian was right in the thick of it there in the Colter Porsche for Doncaster Racing. Contact with Shane Lewis. This man here in the SunTrust Racing, Pontiac Power Riley, was the big winner there. He went to the inside, and that was definitely the preferred line. Let's have a look at the replay. You ride with Dave Murray. Yeah, you're sitting here right now. Look how congested it is. Everybody fighting for a piece of road right there. David getting passed on the inside. You're going to see right here in a minute, there's Wayne. Now, actually, that's Donahue coming by. Now they're racing up to the hairpin. And as they get up here, it's going to get into a break zone battle. There he Whoa. comes. Wayne Taylor chops her. He sees an opening to the inside. Yeah, go for it. He's going. Boop. And you know what happened right there? Just, you know, the, the person moved over. And there, there's a contact. Let's have a look from the outside view and watch the contact. In fact, well. Yeah. There was a bit of overreaction because given too much room, <laughs> I don't think they realized that we're, we're all that tight. Back to your race leader, Scott Pruitt, the reigning Trans Am Series champion. Talking with Scott earlier this weekend, he said how he thoroughly enjoyed coming back to full-time racing. We'll get back to that. Chris, what's happening down there with the uh, Doncaster guys? Well, down at SGS, the Doncaster team is having lots of problems with tires right now. The 71 car was in a few laps ago. This Mindstar car came in because they thought they had a right front going down. It's back in. They're checking the tires. Also, the 91 was just in because of right side tire wear issues. So the, the, the Daytona winning car was in. It looks like they're falling back. This team is having some problems here today with tire wear. That right side, Dorsey, was where it contacted Shane Lewis, wasn't it? Yeah, it was that as well. The right, you know, right sides are a problem here on this racetrack, especially up on the bank. Depending on what the balance of the car is, and you where the right front or the right rear, and that's something we're going to have to conserve. Already we're seeing two of the things you highlighted at the top of the show, Dorsey, and that is tire. Tires are going to be a factor and congestion. Yeah, we're already right. seeing that here at Homestead Miami Speedway. But look at this guy. He is clear, clear sailing out in front and has been that way pretty much all weekend. He is fast, very fast. It's the two Ganassi cars ahead of the Michael Shank racing car. We'll be back, stay with us. You're looking at the race leading car of driver Scott Brewer for Chip Ganassi Racing, the CompUSA machine. He is zeroing in on Forrest Barber. Yes, there he is right there at the bottom of your screen. The car that won the Rolex 24 at Daytona and there's been some misfortune for that team, that car this weekend, and then it was a tough break. Forrest Barber spun the car on the opening lap and has been fighting traffic ever since. Meanwhile, Pruitt has been flying, and this is not what the team needs to go one lap down very, very early in this race. They must really have been off on their setup. Of course, they had to change two different motors or take two engines out and put new ones in. It was overheating. So maybe they didn't have the time to address the, the chassis as much as they would like to. They've really been up against it this weekend. As we've mentioned, a whole host of problems for them. And certainly Terry Borchell is quite a bubbly and happy guy. And he hasn't looked all that happy this weekend. And they just, they were behind the eight ball pretty much right from that first session. So, boy, oh boy, how uh, fortune can turn to misery very quickly. And talking about quickly, look at Pruitt all over the back of Forrest Barber. And we'll get an inside run. Well, I tell you, it was almost like Forrest didn't... Uh Didn't look to me like he got his downshifts in because Scotty just came out of nowhere and just took about eight car lengths right away. And look here, now he works to the top. Got a run going. There's no way Force is going to be able to defend that. Scott Pruitt with plenty of experience on the banking with his time in NASCAR racing as he draws alongside and goes past the Kodak Easy Share. Daytona prototype Forrest Barber now goes one lap down. And that makes the workload a lot higher and a lot harder for Terry Borcella. Calvin. Well, it may look like a Lexus runaway right now as they hold down positions one through four, but speed is one thing in these sprint events, but fuel mileage is another. I spoke to Scott Pruitt before the beginning of the race. He said, we are in dire straits with fuel mileage. The configuration of this engine means we have to run it quite rich, otherwise we'll burn down the back two cylinders. We're going to work on that. We're going to get it better. 
Meanwhile, the Pontiac teams of the winner have really been working hard on mileage. They think they can maybe do this race on one stop, believe it or not. Scott Pruitt's looking at 45 minutes max. There's a huge difference there in mileage, depending on how the cautions fall, that may give the victory to someone else. And Scott Pruitt did a wonderful job there, splitting those cars. David Donoghue is in, in the Red Bull Brumos, Porsche-powered Fab car. The first of the top guys to bring it in. What is the story here? Brian Tilly's on the spot. Or is that, yeah, Brian, what's happening down well, there? Lee, I'm looking underneath the back end of this car. They've shut it down. It has no power, and I can tell you why. There's nothing wrong with the engine, but looking underneath the back end, the rear suspension is damaged. It looks like the push rod that controls the movement up to the shock absorber is broken on the left rear. When you look around up and underneath the back end of this car, you can see it. The mechanics are going to go to work to replace it. It's going to take some time to do it, Lee. Well, I tell you, we saw that before with uh, the Morales car getting curved and so forth. Now, we don't know that David did that, but that's the kind of wound that you receive when you bang off curves and things. A broken push rod. Time to squeeze in a quick break. We will update you on this story, this unfortunate story for the 58 Red Bull combination of David Donoghue and Darren Law. We were expecting big things from these guys this year, but it been a tough start to season 2004 for them. Meanwhile, the battle up front is hot. We'll be back. Well, welcome back to the Grand American Rolex Sports Car Series from Homestead, where the number 58 Brumos Porsche is in the pit. David Donahue, back here in the garage area, not where you should be during the middle of the race. Obvious damage to the car. Slower traffic out there. I know it's very busy. I believe the um, the six car may have gotten into a 911. Yeah, two cars in front of me, and uh, I don't know what happened to Didier, but everyone went out to the right, and I thought I had a clear line in the left, and all of a sudden the six car came shooting across the track again and tagged my right front. In the meantime, as I got on the brakes, Port got in the rear of me. I'm sure he was just following me, and he, you know, he was watching me, and when I jumped on the brakes hard, he was probably right there. He had no chance of uh, avoiding hitting me, but real unfortunate we were just kind of biding our time keep an eye on traffic and so forth and uh, trying to preserve our tires but you know, the Red Bull guys look at it back together and you know, maybe we'll do a couple more laughs and lots of data or something obviously obviously a lot of disappointment after Daytona how do you get this thing back on track and get back into this championship I'll tell you when we do it all right Lee these guys are gonna battle they're gonna get this thing back on the racetrack but it's gonna be a while more disappointment for the Brumos guys Lee so that tells uh, that tells the story doesn't it and uh, look at this I think the 10 has a problem Wayne Taylor the SunTrust racing Pontiac Riley Calvin what's the story well they're setting up down here we understand he's got a dead left front tire there he's cut one down I'm not sure it was in traffic or not Lee but with the mileage that this Pontiac engine gets, these guys may be okay with one more stop after this I mean we're about 30, 40 minutes into this event right now, and uh, they should be able to go the rest of the way with one more stop. That's not the break they were needing. Remember they, can, remember, they came so close to that victory in the 24-hour race. In fact, they determined they had a small fuel leak in that event, which cost them the victory there in terms of running out of gas and costing Antonelli what was a great drive that afternoon. So Wayne will attempt to try and lift this car back in without damaging the car further. And as a driver, what Calvin's talking about is you have a choice to make right here. You want to get back to the pits as quickly as possible, but with the left front cut down, if it should shred and shrapnel, it'll tear the whole front of the car off, and we'll have a replay and take a look at what happened here to poor old Wayne. Yeah, this will tell the story a little better. Problems early on. That's Oswaldo Negri up ahead in the Michael Shank Racing Lexus-powered Doran. You're riding with Wayne Taylor. Watch this. There's your left front. And what's happened there, of course, he's made contact and he's probably torn the valve stem out of the side of the wheel with the contact. In the Let's keep following this story. The 10 is on pit road. Here's Cal. He makes his way down pit lane, 45 miles an hour. He doesn't want to get another infraction here. Don't see too much damage. The left front corner is damaged a little bit. I don't believe they'll change the nose frame at all. Just do tires, fuel. It's going to be Max Angelelli getting in. Remember, Wayne Taylor has returned to racing from what was thought to be a retirement, but he couldn't stay away. He loves this game. He's been a world sports car champion before, and we expected it to be a battle out here. We're finding with these prototypes, they really have to keep their momentum going. 
they don't lose a lot of lap time, and that means the drivers are going to take chances. We see some other tire rubs on the right-hand side. Wayne Taylor actually came around to take a look to see if there's any further damage, but I think these boys will be okay. They're trying to get Angelelli strapped in, waiting on the last gaps of fuel. They got new Goodyear tires on here. Remember, all of the prototype cars run Goodyear tires. No tire battle within category, but certainly three different tire manufacturers throughout the field. Well, you see right there on a good shot, it's been marked from one, so the, one from the front to the back. It's been hit all the way down. But I think what happened is you probably just knocked the valve stem out of that particular wheel, and that's why it went flat. But like I said at the beginning, it's a war, and these guys are really aggressive in brake zones, trying not to lose their momentum, and that's what you get sometimes. And watch Angelelli go when he returns to the track. So two of our top contenders have been taken out with contact and perhaps impatience. You said at the top that you've got to be patient in this traffic. And look here at the overflow. That is the water extractor. So the engine right now running extremely, extremely hot because it's getting no wind coming through the radiator. So right now that gauge is paid. So Angelelli leaves pit lane after Wayne Taylor with an exciting opening stint. The workload is now on the Italian shoulders. We go back up front. Here is our race leader. This is Scott Pruitt continues to lead the way and lead very well no pressure on the reigning trans am series champion right now a little disappointed with their run at the rolex 24 at daytona they thought they could have gone all the way to victory on debut in the daytona prototype category in the end it was still a very strong finish but they want to go a lot better right here at homestead miami speedway of course he'll hand over to mad max the other one it's Pappas coming up Watching round two of the Rolex Sports Car Series here on speed from Homestead Miami Speedway. And you're looking at the race leader, Scott Pruitt, doing a wonderful job at the 01 Pop USA Chip Ganassi Racing Riley with the Lexus power plant. And he started from pole and has not been challenged ever since. Let's bring you up today. It's been a pretty eventful start to this race. Take a look at this. Forrest Barber spun on lap one. Slight contact with the wall, scary spin for Chris Hall in the brand new Pontiac powered Crawford. And then contact here between Oswaldo Negri and Wayne Taylor. And that was quite costly for the SunTrust Racing Organization. And look at this, GT leader in the pits and gone. Chris, what's the story? Well, Borset just came in for fuel, no tires. And these guys aren't having any tire wear issues. Just a quick stop of fuel, it's back out on the track. Hopefully get back up to the leader, GT. BMWs have gone nicely so far in GT. Look wonderful here, Boris doing a double spin. Car looks wonderful in the infield, very quick in the corners I timed it yesterday. Have to pay credit to Ian James in the racers group portion of the 66, because he led GT early on, then Boris came storming through. Justin Marks has consistently been second in that class. He's of course teammate to Boris said. So doing a nice job, quick shot there, there is the uh, spirit of Daytona racing the 09 Stefan Gregoire qualified the car and he has teamed of course with car owner Doug Goad and uh, they learned a lot from their outing at the Rolex 24 at Daytona and here they are now we get into the real rest of the season and this is where it counts beautifully beautifully prepared car wonderful looking car and Gregoire and Goad should prove to be a good combination Currently, the 0-9 oh, sits fourth oh, contact oh. here, though. Stefan Gregoire right there showed his nose. He started easing over to make sure that the BMW knew that he was there. He saw that the driver wasn't aware of his presence, ducked back in, and then look what happened right there. A spin almost takes him out. That was Brady Raffetti. Back going again, though. Team with Carlos Di Caseta. Now, when you get off the road here at Homestead, it's all sandy out there. We'll see a replay of what's happening. here. will bring sand up there. Now look here, Gregoire looks to the inside and then, uh oh, no, no, has to pinch it off quite Ooh. hard. That was close. Thought there may have just been a little bit of contact on the way through there, but luckily no contact at all. Brian, what do you have for us? The lead, the 39 car rolling into a stop a little early for these guys, but Chris Hall has said on the radio, they've lost the power steering in this Pontiac Crawford. He has switched it off, they're driving without it, but if anybody can get it figured out, it should be the guys on this team. Chris Hall, I believe, will be getting out of the car. Larry Wayne will be getting in, but you'll notice on the side it says Georgia Institute of Technology, and 
very interesting program they have going here. They're actually utilizing a lot of the kids from the Georgia Institute of Technology and helping them with their studies, both in marketing, business, and in mechanical engineering. They've got students that are working on business plans for this program, helping them learn and also helping the team. And they also have mechanical engineering students that are helping out. There's a kid here, Scott Flanagan, this weekend who came in, put his computer skills to work, got the traction control working with some software upgrades and really a team effort here, and it helps both the racers and the students alike. As Larry Wayne gets in, he is an alumnus of Georgia Institute of Technology, and he's been instrumental in setting up this program. I think it's great for the school, great for this race team, and great for Larry, because he's got a bunch of smart guys working for him, Lee. Yeah, it's a wonderful job, and uh, it's a good program. Now, normally, you know, Lee, losing the power steering on a smaller car like this wouldn't be that big of a problem. But because of this 20 degrees of banking and the artificial loading, I've had this happen at Daytona to me. You cannot believe how strong your arms have to work to keep the car just going straight on the banking. These guys will be really tucking out quickly. So as Larry Huang takes to the wheel of their new car, they only took delivery of this at Rolling Road in South Carolina on last Tuesday. So it's very early days for this program, but the guys are extremely excited. There's a bit of a hold up there in the Silverstone pit. Well, I'll tell you what, after about 20 laps, he'll be screaming on the radio, get me a power steering pump in. <laughs> yeah. Here is the order as we go to break. It's still Chip Ganassi, 1-2. It's Pruitt, Morales, and Didier Taze. Lexus, 1-2 and 3. Then Stefan Gregoire, Ozzy Negri, and Court Wagner, top six. Well, welcome back to Homestead, where the second place Daytona prototype, the 02, comes in for its first pit stop. Jimmy Morales gets out, Luis Diaz gets in, and this will be Diaz's first taste of competition in a prototype car. Actually, his first taste of uh, competition in a car where you can't see the tires. He's an Atlantic standout, a Toyota Atlantic standout, which is a small winged formula car. He's really had to get used to not just driving a car with a roof on it, but the visibility in these cars is very difficult. He is getting in a machine that is obviously very competitive, so a lot of pressure on this young Mexican driver. A great stop, fuel, tires, driver change down and away. No problems here, really. He said, I've been training so hard for this season. I'm excited to be back into a, a regular, a full-time drive. He said, I've been training hard. I've lost quite a bit of weight. He said, but they're so hot inside these things. He said, I'm going to lose more weight. There's going to be nothing left of me. What's happening in the uh, spirit of Daytona pit, Cal? Well, there's a bit of a surprise start because there's a bit of a delay here. Stefan Gregoire, after a good opening stint, is now turning it over to Doug Go, the car owner. This team had a bit of a problem earlier in the weekend, lost an engine, lost very important and valuable track time. But meanwhile, the rest of the stop looks routine. So the crew member is substituting for the driver here and assisting with Doug Go getting in the car. But there is a major water leak inside this car. Just over Doug's right shoulder, there is literally water pouring into the cockpit. So I'd imagine this is more than an overflow situation. They have some major leak going on in the engine bay. It's going to need attention. I'll tell you one thing you don't want is water pouring in there because it's not going to be ice water to drink. It's going to be really hot water. And you look right there, they finally took the seat insert off the top of the, of the car there. From the pits, we join the 16. This is the SGS class leading car with Dave Murray behind the wheel. And we remind you that Dave has come from last to lead his class. And currently, he sits in 21st position overall, the class leading car in SGS. And what a mighty job for the ASCO Motorsports organization. What a dramatic turnaround for them after a frustrating 24 hour. Chris. Craig, it was a real frustrating 24 hour. You guys came back, you grabbed pole here today, but then you had the infraction. Now you guys are back at the front of the pack. It's got to feel pretty good. Yeah, you know, the Osco Porsche is doing great. Uh, we're really optimistic here. Pretty loud here. <laughs> we're really optimistic about today. David's doing a great job. The team has done a great job. We go from the back to the front. Um, I want to thank you know, all the fans that are watching the Speed Channel. We should be able to have a good car for the end. We're going to try to make it in one stop if it goes all green. Well, the 16's looking strong. Brian Till's up with the leader. Absolutely. The strongest car out there right now, the 01 car on pit road for a fuel, tires, and a driver change. Max Pappas is in. Scott Pruitt is out. Two both very experienced endurance racers. You think of these guys as formula car drivers. They've done it all in endurance racing, and they're doing it all again today as Pappas leaves pit lane. Lee? In a real hurry, Max 
It's going to be wonderful to see him out there. Scott Pruitt did an outstanding job from pole position to lead every single lap of this race so far. And now it's time for the very talented Italian to have his run. There's Mad Max right there looking at him in the office, taking a little wink at a camera there. He's got warm tires at the back because he did a burnout right in her face there, but the front tires he's going to have to be cautious of for at least a lap or two to get some temp up. He knows all that already. Max said to me yesterday, I'm looking forward to getting out there, mixing it, rubbing wheels, and making a few donuts on other cars. Brian. Well, Jay Policastro brought the Daytona leading 44 car in. They won the 24-hour of Daytona, running well in GT here today. They came in, Policastro out. His father, Joe Policastro, is, has gotten in the car, but there is going to be a penalty on this car. I saw the officials waving at the fueler whose visor was up. That visor has to be down as they fuel this car. You see the official holding him right now. A costly penalty for this 44 car. They won at Daytona. It's going to be difficult here today, Lee. Yeah, there's a lot of competition with the two PTG BMWs, and they've been running very well. Justin Marks and Boris said came in for just tires and uh, for, rather for fuel only, no tires and no driver chain. So they're running well, and so too Ian James in the Racers Group Porsche. He will hand over to RJ Valentine and Chris Gleason. That's these guys main competition in GT. Let me tell you, when you're sitting in that car after a driver change and that guy holds you for 10 seconds, it feels like an hour because you want to get on with the program. Oh, we got trouble here down off of turn one. And that's one of the Planet Earth cars. That's the Nonamakers, Joe and Will Nonamaker. And frustration there because it looks like they are beach. They're stuck. That's yeah, the that's... 41 with Joe Nonamaker, the father behind the wheel. It's a hard play. He's very well stuck right there. You come off turn one and off the banking and you hit that flat and it's real easy to get turned around as he's done. And you see what the end result is. He's in a danger zone. It might even have been out of caution. Depends on if they can get to him. And the 27 is in. This is Didier Taze. We will get sent to see Jan Magnussen, I'm sure. Cal. Well, the leader comes down pit lane. He'll be turned over to Jan Magnussen. Now, this is Jan's first drive in Grand Am competition after he drove the car for the first time on Thursday. He said, man, this is an adjustment, but he says a lot of fun. It doesn't have a lot of downforce, he said, but the biggest thing I'm having to get used to is driving a car for the first time in many years that doesn't have power steering. He said, you really get a lot of kickback through the wheel, something I'm going to have to get used to. But if anyone can put the pedal to the metal, is this man. He's got a lot of work this year running several different sports cars and uh, touring car series around the world. And meanwhile, they're making a slight adjustment here on the rear wing. I believe they've got a slightly smaller wicker bill on the rear end, takes some downforce away. I'd imagine that DDA had radioed in and said he had a slight push with the car. I believe it went to a smaller one anyway. We'll check on that, just trying to fine tune the balance of the car. And this is a finely honed team that made no difference to the pit stop. They're still waiting on fuel, so they recognize the fact they couldn't make that change. And not the car. Well, in the meantime, while all that was going on, we've gone to a full course caution because of the uh, incident we saw with the Porsche stuck in the gravel trap. That wing adjustment on the back taking downforce off the rear lead, which will take away some of that understeer that he must be feeling. Jan Magnussen, he's the reigning Danish touring car champion, of course, former F1 driver for the Stuart Ford team. He spent time in Champ Car, of course, the American Le Mans series. He's a very diverse driver. And wonderful to see him in a Daytona prototype. He's always been a, a fan favorite, that's for sure. The 59 is in, and JC France handing over to sports car legend Hurley Hayward. These guys won this round this time last year. It was the first time ever that a DP won overall. Cal. And you're right, Lee, as Hurley Hayward jumping in, JC qualified the car yesterday, did a great job, team were very happy with that performance, and boy, did he put on a run here last year. Extremely brutal conditions here last year, a lot cooler this year, but JC was up to the task and brought the car to victory lane, the first overall win for a Daytona prototype in Grand Am competition. But you got a lot of experience now going behind the wheel, and it's interesting to see how this fuel strategy plays out. I believe the Porsche would have gone a little bit longer than the Lexus, but the team has taken advantage of this full caution period. And this is the stronger, at the moment, the stronger of the two Porsche-powered Brumos Fab cars because the adversity that was thrown the way of the Red Bull 58, David Donahue on board with that contact. As the Brumos guys work flat out to try and send Hurley as quick as they can during this first full course caution. Hayward is now away. And boy, oh boy, the question is still up in the air. Who will win this one? The Ganassi car is looking strong, but so too is the Doran Lister. Buckler leads the way in GT ahead of Boris said, and so too does Dave Murray in the SGS class. We'll be back.
back at Homestead and we are still under a full course caution due to the uh, Planet Earth Motorsports Porsche spin, but there's been plenty happening in the pits. Or after a great run as Valdo Negri Jr. is now turning the car over to the very young 23-year-old Bert Frizzell. He's been doing a great job in practice and testing. Let's see if he can handle the pressure right now. Veteran of Barber Dodge Racing, but there you see the team is working hard trying to get some water down through the radiator. A little bit of damage there, Ozzy must have tagged someone. May have damaged the system, they're just trying to get the engine cooled down. Meanwhile, Mike Shank at the front of the car, the fueling wasn't done, and again, it's all about experience, Bert was in a hurry there. Well, the SunTrust team are in, I think they're again taking advantage of this caution period, there's no real need. Remember that stop they had to make when Wayne Taylor had the damage to the left front corner. And on their last stop, they had a very lengthy time getting the fuel into the system. The team then went to work, completely tore the fuel system apart. Apparently the fuel was in and the car was full, but there was no kickback on the vent hose to indicate that that had happened. So a lengthy delay there and just cost them valuable time under that green flag stop earlier in the run. Well, the car that nearly won the Daytona 24 hours in the pits is going to be Andy Wallace, the man who's won all of the big ones, now getting his chance behind the wheel. Mil Cardino has done a great job. Remember, this is her first time in Grand Am competition this year, so it's been a big adjustment for her. She has a lot of help and a lot of experience now with Andy Wallace on this team. And what a team this is. Max Crawford, such a class act after the disappointment of Daytona, coming so close, losing victory in the final hour there when the rear suspension broke. And he said that none of the other Crawfords had a similar problem. He thinks it was really just something that was uh, isolated on the two car. And they think that the car got up in the air during the midnight hours there at Daytona and suffered a little bit of damage to that bell housing. So looks like a routine stop. Max Crawford trying to oversee things down here. And as we go back to racing here at Homestead Miami Speedway, and it is the 0-1, Max Pappas, who leads the way back to green. It's Ganassi 1 and 2. Young Luis Diaz running second, but he's got Jan Magnussen right behind. And this is a fantastic threesome to have up front. Two ex-Formula 1 races, two ex-Kart races, and a young Toyota Atlantic star. Sensational stuff in the top three, and they'll go hard at it. Just behind them uh, on the restart, looked there, the BMW 4 said, made a great start, jumped ahead, and now he's in the fray. The 70 Workscape Speed Source Ford powered Multimatic is in the middle there, the 70 car, but it's further down in the order. They have dropped to 21st position and several laps down. You're looking at first, second, and third in the Daytona prototype category. Up front, great run on debut. The fourth place car is the 81 of Court Wagner and Kelly Collins. It's been a strong start for that campaign. Actually, that was Bill Arbelin in the BMW that made the great start in that for us. They switched back there. Here we go. Underneath for the pass on the banking. This is great. 20 degrees of banking. A lot of room to maneuver. An amazing run for the Lexus powered cars. Boy, they have been strong all weekend. And again, and consistently in the top three, they fill all three places. And we have to highlight the fact that a Lexus powered Daytona prototype is yet to win in the Rolex Sports Car Series. Dorsey, it could very well be their day. Yeah, it could be their day indeed. Very strong showing. Yeah, Jan Magnussen in there. We know he's a bulldog. We've seen it before. He won't hold back whatsoever. Luis Diaz, this is something new for him, as Brian mentioned earlier. Coming out of the Atlantics, he did one very brief uh, champ car race for Fernandez Racing in Mexico City, where well, the fans love that. But this is something completely new. Never driven a car like this. A big challenge, and he's looking forward to it. Here comes Jan Magnussen on the inside and makes that move stick. Yeah, and you know what? It was really smart right there. Diaz lets him have enough room, tucks him behind, and that didn't cost either of them any time on the racetrack because there's a big battle going on right here. Let's see if he can get a draft going. One of the new DPs, the Pontiac powered Crawford that was in the top five not so long ago was the 09 Spirit of Daytona racing machine. Now look at Diaz come back on the inside. Great stuff from the young Mexican. That's exactly what I was talking about, getting a good run on the banking, use the draft. It's not going to be enough to get by Madison here in the break zone. But the race is on. Certainly is. And Pappas has a two second advantage at the moment. There's Mad Max up ahead. So it's Ganassi, Doran Lister and Ganassi fill the top three. Two Riley chassis cars and a Doran in the middle. Getting back to the story on the 09 Spirit of Daytona, Daytona prototype. Problems for Doug Goad and 
take a look at this. Pretty frantic stuff in pit lane during the caution. I think they think it's on fire back there. You look right here, they were looking in. I don't believe that it was ever on fire. They've got a leak of something back there. You see Doug Oden now getting out quickly. Something I'm missing now. Uh, well, you remember Calvin mentioned about water leaking everywhere in the cockpit. Brian Till is there. Let's find out more. When you talk about the spirit of Daytona, it looks like the spirit on Doug Goat's face is kind of broken today. Obviously, bad luck. You don't want to be standing here. Was it a fire in the back or just some type of a fuel or a fluid leak? Yeah, apparently, uh, we had a bit of an overheat uh, when we came in for the pit stop. And uh, one way or another, we got too much water out of the car. We were trying to get it back around under that caution. And uh, I think we blew a head gasket and then we caused an electrical fire. There was water everywhere. So, uh, unfortunately, just one of those things that... Uh, Learning the car, learning what it's capable of doing, what it doesn't want to do. We made a mistake, I think. So we'll go back to the back, see if we can't figure it out, get it next time. But we do know what it's capable of, and that's running in the top five. And I think the Pontiac guys, they've got something for the guys in the license league. They're trying very, very hard. So too is Andy Wallace. Andy is now back on the lead lap and running very well. He's taken over from Milkaduno. And that number two, Sitco Crawford, will be up front in the not too distant future. Exciting stuff. Bert Frizzell is running in sixth as well in the Michael Shank Racing Lexus Doran. You got to know that Andy Wallace, you know, sitting there in the pits watching this, that we got a lap down. You got to know he's ready to go. You know, that guy has won more races and done more things in, in the sports car racing than almost anybody in this field. So he's going to be a player. At the moment, the top eight cars are just covered by 28 seconds. And this race is far from over. Almost at the 50 lap mark. It's 109 laps or two and three quarter hours, whichever comes first. And here is Terry Borchella in the 54. And that car currently down in 13th position. And not giving up the fight. Let's see if Magnuson can eat into Pappas's lead. He can't, I don't think. Oh, he's in deep, way too deep. It's up the outside. Oh, oh, oh. A good save, actually. I saw he just left the braking way too late. That was a good recovery, though, by an experienced driver. Look what that does. Now, Diaz all over the back of him. Saw that mistake. Maybe can get a run up here. Diaz might be young and inexperienced in these cars, but he is an aggressive young driver, and he'll take an opportunity when it presents itself. Brian, what do you have? Well, Didier Te is obviously one of the better-known names in sports car racing, but I tell you, I've seen you drive a lot of cars, but this is real racing. The competition has been great here today. I know you've got to love the competition and the great racing that's going on. Yeah, it's very tight. You cannot make any mistake, and the car needs to be perfect. Uh, that's the reason why this morning, I mean, the first thing, I couldn't really follow the leaders. Uh, the, the balance was a bit off. I was a little bit of an understeering in a, in a high-speed corner. Now, we, after this pit stop, we reduce the rear downforce, and it looks like the car is much better for Jan. Well, Jan is out there now. We just saw him make a mistake trying to chase down the leaders. A small mistake. How difficult is it going to be for him to get used to this car? Very different from what he's used to driving. Oh, it, you know, he drove the GT cars, you know, uh, the lately, and uh, he can drive any sports car. I think in good, he's in good shape right now. There's probably not a better, more competitive driver bearing on pit road. Let's see what they can do with it, guys. Well, as we saw the replay right there, one of the smart things that he did do, Jan got in way too deep, and he knew it. He didn't even attempt to make the corner. He just went straight with the brakes on until he got the speed scrubbed off and then turned, which did not spin the car. Had he tried to make the corner at that speed, he would have spun and been out there in that ditch. And that is, uh, that is a, 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 an experienced driver. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> it came out eventually. <laughs> to highlight how costly that's, that uh, wide run was for Magnussen, he'd got it down from two seconds to 1.6, the gap between Pappas and himself. Then it blew out to 3.2 seconds on this last lap. But now he and Diaz are starting to push and push hard. So let's see if they can catch Pappas up front. I'll tell you what, young Luis Diaz right now having a really good seat to watch this thing. You'll learn a lot right now. Just learn a great deal following Jan Magnussen. He is such a nice guy, well-spoken guy, well-presented. Great driver, comes from the Doricon Racing Team into another high-profile team, the Chip Ganassi Racing Organization. Deserves this drive. Jimmy Morales, his teammate, did a wonderful job in the opening stint to get that car up into a challenging position. There's your top five overall, and in the Daytona prototype class, this is what it looks like for the Super Grand Sport. That battle is endless. We'll keep you in touch with that one. You're watching the Grand Prix of Miami Round 2 of the Rolex Sports Car Series.
here from Homestead, Miami Speedway in Florida. And after 57 laps, it's Mad Max out in front. Max Pappas leads the way in the Comp USA Pond uh, Lexus powered Riley. But Chip Ganassi Racing, he leads Jan Magnussen for Doran Lister. And then the second Ganassi car with Luis Diaz in there. And we should highlight the fact that two of the top five cars are brand new cars this race. It is the 0-2 with Diaz and the 81 for Paul Wagner and Kelly Collins, the RX.com car. An outstanding effort from those guys. And we've got more news to tell you about Andy Wallace and the Sitco car in just a moment. But first, let's hear from Scott Pruitt. He's with Brian. Well, Lee, you talk about Max Pappas leading this thing, but the man who gave him the car put it on the pole and then was leading. Scott, what kind of car did you hand over to Max? First, got to say hi to my family at home. <laughs> Car's good. Little understeer. We thought we were going to get some more degradation in the rear tire. The power down problem, but the, uh, the Ganassi car is running good. We, we, we still got that understeer thinking it, it was going to go away during the run, but it didn't. Made a few tire pressure adjustments for Max on the way in. Looks like it might be a little bit better, but all in all, the Comp USA car is doing a great job. The change of compound that you guys made to qualify with and then the harder compound to race on, that changed the balance of the car at all? No, it didn't. We were able to just take it, bolt on those tires, qualify, and take them back off. The only thing we did was increase downforce. There's going to be a lot more traffic in the race, so we want to have a little bit more extra downforce on the car not to fight that. Now plan your work, work your plan. For these guys, it looks like it's working out just fine, Lee. It's been a good day for those guys so far, hasn't it? Pretty smooth sailing, no contact. It's been some close calls. <laughs> yes, yeah, going to be more, too. Well, they've been enjoying a time up front, the 21. PTG, BMW, of Boris Sid and Bill Orblin, they've had a marvelous day as well. Here they are. This is Orblin now behind the wheel. Reigning Speed World Challenge Touring Car Champion. And let's hear from his teammate right now with Chris Neville. Thanks, Lee. Down here with Boris said, Boris, Daytona was a real tough weekend for you guys. Definitely not what you expected. Definitely not what we typically see out of PTG. You guys turn it around this weekend. Is this going to be a cakewalk for you? Uh, no, I don't know. I mean, after Daytona, that was a shame. But, uh, you know, this PTG team went back to work and rebuilt the cars, and this M3 is really fast now. And uh, performance friction went to work, gave us great brakes, new calipers, and uh, cars, the ultimate driving machine. So we had a little bad luck when the pace car came out and got behind, but we're making it up pretty fast now. And uh, if all goes well, we're going to bring home a win for uh, all the BMW fans at home. Right now, the car's in third. But the other team car, Justin Marks, still has not done his driver change with Joey Hand. Justin Marks has done a nice job today, and Joey Hand, another Toyota Atlantic graduate, he will step into the 22. We should highlight the fact that the class leading car in GT is the Kevin Buckler Liz Halliday 67. Yes, you heard right. Kevin is no longer racing in the 66 in this series. He and Liz sharing the 67, and that will be the partnership all season long in 2004. Buckler arrived here very late to the circuit, did not get much time in the car, but they are running nicely out in front of GT at the moment. Well, I'll tell you what, this is something else with Arbelin trying to catch up. There's the lead GT car at 67, racers group. Do you know why they swapped? I said, what's going on? Why, why are you not in the, your famous 66? He said, can you believe it? These other guys think there's something about the 66. They asked me if they could drive it, <laughs> if they could have that number. He said, yeah, sure. You'll find out that there's nothing that particularly special about it. It's got nothing to do with the number. And there is Liz Halliday, you know, female driver doing a great job. Yeah, you know, they're funny like that. <laughs> the guys, they think they've got the, the better machine. So he switched with them. Good for him. Tucked in behind those guys is the 44 for Orbit Racing. The Pollock Castros and Mike Fitzgerald. That is, of course, the Rolex 24 GT class winning car and, and a second overall. A sensational effort by those guys. Of course, they were teamed also with Johnny Molan and Robin Liddell. And they're all walking around with their new Rolex watches on this weekend, <laughs> all feeling pretty uh, pretty pleased with themselves. Pretty timely. Yeah. There you go. Mentioned to you about new Daytona prototypes, and we should make mention, there's the Praskowskis in, uh, in the Essex Racing Speed Secrets Ford-powered Multimatic. They've done a great job so far. They're sitting on the lead lap in the top 10 in eighth position at the moment, right behind Hurley Haywood. See Mad Max, real quick hands right there. Got turned in, pinched off a little bit, got loose, had to do a little opposite lock. Didn't bother him a bit. 
Max leads. Pappas, that is, from Magnuson, Diaz, and Wallace is zeroing in. He's now only, he's about 20 seconds behind the leaders. At Homestead, and speaking of new cars, new Daytona prototypes, the 81 for GMW Motorsports, the RX.com entry, here it is, with Kelly Collins behind the wheel, and again we must emphasize the point that Kelly is helping out, filling in for the injured Brent Martini, of course the reigning GT champion along with Court Wagner. Wagner and Martini has become a very familiar combination. One car off to the side there, and they're running very strong at the moment, so much so they're in the top five, and this is this car's first race. Good effort, Calvin. Absolutely, the man who in fact won the GT class here, yeah, almost snuck the overall win. Times have changed, there are a lot more DPs in the field. You're in one of them that was delivered here this weekend. You've got to be stoked with the performance today. Really happy. The guys, you know, RX.com, GW Motorsports, Jordan Virgo watches, these guys are put together an amazing effort. I mean, the car was delivered literally brand new to the track, never turned a wheel, never was on the dyno, anything. So it's a testament to how great this crew is. It's just, you know, any performance here this weekend is really a testament to these guys. I can't thank them enough. A lot of action out there early. You actually had a bird's eye view of the incident that put David Donahue out. What happened there? Uh, needless to say, it was too much of a bird's eye view because Donahue and I had some contact down in three. Um, he was just avoiding another car that's about in front of him. We came together. It's nobody's fault. It was a race incident, but it didn't stop. We had a good battle going and the car was running great. Again, RX.com is an incredible effort. BMW power in that machine as well. It'll be interesting to see as these last laps will roll down here if any fuel mileage will come into play for a position change. Absolutely amazing how good a job they've done in this series getting all these different chassis and engines to be so equal. I mean, the top four cars, three of those four cars qualifying within the same one tenth of a second, and you see the competition on the racetrack is unbelievable. Speaking of it here, look at it up front as they work their way through traffic. Past Liz Halliday comes Jan Magnussen in the Doran Lister, the Lexus-powered Doran. He's got Luis Diaz right behind, but Pappas has been able to skip away. Max is enjoying about a five, five and a quarter second lead over Magnussen and Diaz. And Andy Wallace seems to have been caught up in traffic because he's now dropped to about 22 seconds back from the lead car. You heard Didier Pay say before, not only are the cars equal, but you have to have your setup exactly right. And you heard Scott Pruitt say that it wasn't as good as he wanted it to. And so before they turned it over to Mad Max, they changed the wicker bill in the back just a little bit, adjusted some tire pressures to get them some a high speed understeer they had. And maybe that's what's paying off right now. Just to finish a point on the GW Motorsports, the 81, the uh, Kelly Collins Fort Wagner car. Court was all smiles there, but it was hardly the case throughout this weekend. They had major, major electrical problems throughout the weekend. They lost an incredible amount of time and really only came back out in full force in, in time for qualifying. So to see that car running so strong in the top five is great. Bert Frizzell is currently running sixth, seventh this early Haywood. And Max Angelelli is running eighth at the moment ahead of the Praskowskis. Jack Baldwin, Shane Lewis, after Lewis started that car, he's now running in the 57 in the GT class. So a very big day for Shane Lewis. As you mentioned, so many of these cars are brand new cars. So, I mean, these, there's some teething problems that we're seeing right now, but uh, the parity is just unbelievable. This is whole class built on the premise of a cheaper way to go race, a little less expensive for more people to play. Hey, they've got my vote. I think they're doing a Motorsports Porsche is still leading SGS by the way and second in that class is Randy Popes after taking over from Michael Levitas. Third is Andy Lally. So two TPC cars, two TPC Porsches in the top three. And great job here by the Mexican, although he locks up a little there. Diaz is not letting Jan Magnussen escape. Now I like the fact that the young guy doesn't care who's in front of me, just doesn't want him there. So I drive in a little bit too deep, locked up the front, knew it right away, vibrated it out of the brake pedal, no damage done. Interesting, isn't it? Jan Magnussen and those years he spent with Stuart Ford in Formula One. Luis Diaz could only dream of getting to Formula One. That was his goal. Perhaps still is his goal. His open wheel of career, as far as he's concerned, is not over. And here he is playing with an ex-Formula One driver on a level playing field. And one of the things that an open wheel driver has trouble with in these closed cars at first is knowing when the tires are locked up. You can see it in the Formula Atlantic car. It's right in front of your face. But here in this car, you have to develop the feel. You have to feel the sensitivity of the steering wheel go blank on you. And know that the tire is locked up. Get off the brake right then before you damage the tire. 
66 laps already down and again this is a 109 lap race or two and three quarter hours and leading the way as it has been pretty much the whole day it is the ganassi car of max pappas and scott Pruitt. stay with us more from homestead after this just 40 laps left to run here at the grand prix of miami homestead miami speedway and you're looking at the Colter Porsche for Doncaster Racing, Robert Julian. In fact, that looks like it could be Jean-Francois Dumoulin, just by the helmet colours behind the wheel now in the 91. This was the SGS class winning car from the Rolex 24 at Daytona. And it's been an uncharacteristic weekend for these guys. Would you agree, Chris? Yeah, Lee just checked in with the Doncaster guys. John Lacey down here said, you know, they, they were really looking to have a strong weekend. However, Bobby Julian did make some contact early on in the race with one of the prototypes. That's why he cut down the tire. And it looks like the car is not handling just the way that Jean Francois is looking for. So they're just going to have to try and a uh, minor piece of cues out there, hopefully get a good weekend and move on to the next race. Hopefully, this will be a good position for the championship. The 16, it's been all the Asco Motorsport car dominating the SGS class after coming from behind. We ride with them right now. Talk us through the banking doors. You've got, you've got plenty of experience on, on speedways. You see right there, I mean, that's the banking. All he moved up the racetrack, you see right there is the 59 Drumos. Porsche entry goes by. Um, the banking's a great thing because it artificially loads the car. I mean, it's great unless you have no power steering, when it makes it a lot harder to drive. Um, but it gives you a, a rest if it does, if everything's working right, you can actually loosen the grip on the wheel, sit there and take a deep breath or two, take the several seconds it takes to go around the bank before you get to this twisty bit where you got to work so hard. I see all the mud coming off the car. It's been off the road in front of it. Right behind this car, as far as the SGS class is concerned is the Michael Levitas Randy Pope's entry for TPC Racing and it literally is right there. Greg Stanton of course didn't have the finish he wanted at Daytona looking to redeem himself here doing a great job hitting David Murray of course we documented David Murray started at the very back went to the very front fantastic drive and handed over to this man Craig Stanton. Hey, a little, oh. little help from my friend here. That was Andy Lally and that's in fact I thought that may have been Randy Pope's just Judging by the color schemes, there's three cars that look identical. 36, 37, 38. And that's Andy Lally that's in the 38 right now. And Andy is pushing hard after taking over from Mark Bunting. Well, Craig knows he's there now. I guarantee that much. <laughs> Gives him a little shot there. Bit the of team driving there. Putting plenty of pressure on Craig Stanton. Nice to see those guys having a strong run after the troublesome time at the Rolex 24 for Dennis Arce and his Arsco Motorsport organization. But TPC are running strong. Three cars in this race. They're not done with yet. There's Post and Lally, part of that team, pushing Stanton hard. Well, but welcome back to Homestead, where Scott Pruitt will take the rest of the afternoon out. off. Max Pappas will stay in the leading 0-1 Comp USA. Lexus Daytona prototype. It's a normal routine stop for these guys. They did change tires. They're going to fill it with fuel. It should be the last time they're on pit road. And look for them to get back out and put this thing in the lead. They have been strong all day long.
down here with Max Crawford, who will the charge of Andy Wallace in the number two sitcom machine. Max, we're seeing the Lexus stop really early. You've worked hard on mileage. Any chance you can make it the rest of the way? No, unfortunately not this time. We had to stop too early because of the yellow. How sure are you? Uh, about five laps now. Unfortunately, the, uh, we were trying to get Milka to go her full tank ball and couldn't make it. We, we took the opportunity of the yellow. Just, if it would have been a couple of laps later, we would have been OK. Handled the disappointment of the 24 hours with a lot of dignity, Max. How tough was that to take? Um, actually, I, I'm still very proud of what we achieved. So uh, it hasn't been that tough, to be honest with you. When I look back on what we achieved, I, I'm still pretty proud. Well, superb team here. We expect a lot of success from them further into the season. Maybe even today, maybe Andy can pull this one out of the bag. Let's go down to Chris <laughs> Well, the, the 22 car just came in. Justin Marks handed the right duties over to Joey Hand. Guys are the young guns on this PTG team. Both of them 125 years old and a lot of experience. Roger McGoris said and Bill Oberlin. Real good stop for him. Back out on track. Just over 30 laps to run here at Homestead Miami Speedway, round two of the Rolex Sports Car Series. You're watching the battle for the lead. It's the Dane, Jan Magnussen, up against the Mexican, Luis Diaz. And it's Doran Lister racing against Chip Ganassi racing. Both wow. Lexus-powered cars, but the difference is the lead car is a, is a Doran chassis. The second place car is a Riley chassis as they side their way through the traffic. And Diaz has not let Magnussen get away. No, and I'll tell you one thing I've seen. Luis Diaz is better under braking than Yan is. When they get to the end of the straightaway right here, it's one of his good spots. I saw Magnussen make a little mistake locking the front brake before. Diaz has been able to make ground right in this area every lap. If this traffic's going to play into somebody's hand, of course, more experience is Magnussen. But look at all the cars they got to go through. This is incredible. They've been talking about traffic all weekend. And I mean, Dorsey, talk about it from a driver's standpoint. You I imagine you have to use every bit of talent you've got and you have to be very decisive to make your move right there and then to get through this slower traffic. Yeah, and Magnuson would like very much, you know, not to have somebody right on his tail where we could set this up and get these cars picked off one by one in a fashionably order. As it is right now, though, with Diaz right underneath him, he's got to be desperate. He's got to dive bomb. Look right here. Oh, up the inside. Magnuson, great stuff. But Diaz still there, and as Dorsey mentioned, he's so good under brakes. He had to follow. He, had to, he cannot get picked off with one of these lap cars. So you have to go. If the lead car goes, you go too. I mean, you're running a risk of having an accident possibly, but it makes no difference right now. These are into it big. If you've joined us late, we, the uh, reigning series champion, Terry Borchella and Forrest Barber for Bell Motorsports had some tough luck early. Barber started the race, spun the car, slight contact with the wall, then went a lap down very early. Borchella took over. He's been fighting valiantly and here's the 21 that's uh, Bill Orbelin he has come back into the pits Chris Bill Orbelin just came back back pits these guys are having a fuel pickup problem so this was completely on them off guard they built up the car they gave Bill Bill rubber to get back on the racetrack but this is really playing in the hands of Joey and Justin Marks wow that was the lead car in class and the and the second place car in class might get by now look at the lead overall it's not over with Luis Diaz really impressing me this young kid up against one of the best sports car racers in the world. He doesn't care. He doesn't at all. He's pushing well. First race in the Rolex Sports Car Series. And it was agonizing for young Luis because he was on the sidelines. He was at Daytona for the 24 hour. But of course, just the three drivers in that one car with Jimmy Morales, Scott Pruitt, 
or rather there was four Scott Dixon and uh, and Max Pappas so Diaz had to sit that one out but now he has his own car with Jimmy Morales and they're running well they're sitting second at the moment well I told you how much better he was in braking not that time got in a little too deep locked the brake up although we did a masterful job of keeping the thing on the road oh and we've got a problem up in front of the leaders that was the Sun Trust car huge lock up Max Angelelli going down hard on the brakes into the right hander nerve-wracking I tell you you see all that stuff in front of you happening you just wish all, everybody just let you could be and they don't ever do <laughs> we also lost we also uh, lost early the 58 Red Bull Brumos Porsche David Donahue and Darren Law with some serious suspension problem and they had to go behind the wall there was contact out on the track you heard Court Wagner mention that earlier so two of the big name cars copped a uh, pretty rough go of it very early Diaz really working now I'm watching what he's doing he's moving the car around he turned in much later that time than Yan did what he's trying to do is square the corner off and get to the throttle earlier and run up the inside it didn't have it didn't work but he's trying right now he's trying different lines different things on the racetrack to find a way to get around this car watch this guy down in one 30 laps to go and it could still easily go by laps. It's 109 laps or two and three quarter hours. We've only had one full course caution, so plenty of green running. Yeah, a lot of green running, and, I, and that's more than I would have thought because of the quality of these cars and how close they are. You think there would be a lot of pushing and banging, and of course it's not over yet. Well, we just saw Max Pappas bring the 0-1 in and top up with fuel. He's good to go to the end. What's the story with the 27, Cal? Well, they, well, will, they definitely will definitely need, need fuel, fuel and so will the 0-2 car. We're talking to Kevin around that. They're trying to scheme away where they, 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 they can minimize the time spent on pit lane. They may only change the right side tires. This may be only the right front. There'll be a time fuel stop. They don't need a full fuel load. And even down to the driver's bubble, Kevin went over to the DDA He said, will he be first? He said, yeah. He said, man, I'm not going to waste time giving him a water bottle. He's only a little guy. doesn't need much water. I tell you what, they're getting hot and heavy right now up the front. Look at Diaz. Magnuson actually went defensive for the first time. He actually put a block, threw a little block in. Here he comes, Diaz. Diaz in. Yep. Diaz coming in. So the 0-2 is in. We've already seen Pappas fueled up. So one Ganassi car is good to go. Now the second one on pit road. And we'll see how quick and efficient this stop is. A magnificent run for this car's first outing as well. Checkered flag. How long will that pit stop be for the race leading car of Jan Magnussen, the Doran Lister, Lexus Doran? We will find out. There is Kevin Doran, the boss, and they're working the numbers. The pressure is on. Back with it in the Sitco number two with Andy Wallace for Howard Boss Motorsports. This is the Pontiac Howard Crawford. Has his hands full right now, fighting off the challenge from Kelly Collins in the 81. And it looks like Kelly may have already got by. He has, there he is. He scooted by. And we know we heard from Max Crawford that Andy does have to come back in before the end of this race to top up for fuel. Here is the RX.com car of Kelly Collins. This is for GW Motorsports' very first race in this car. And they now sit up in second in this race. Magnuson leads the way. The BMW powered Doran, the first of its kind, and what I mean is this configuration. We've seen so many different power plants in different chassis. But the first BMW powered Doran. All these different engines and so forth are regulated on their horsepower to make around 500. They do it in the valve train, they do it in RPM, they do it by which gearbox you use. The BMW itself can run 7,000 RPM, it runs a five speed gearbox. 
first BMW powered car to come out was last year when we had the BMW powered Piccio. Of course, that car is in this field today. Then along came uh, PAP Parts Southern Motorsports, the car that Jack Baldwin and Shane Lewis are racing today. And that was, of course, the BMW Fab car. And this is the first for the BMW Doran. Talk to Steve Dynan, one of the BMW engine gurus. And look right here up front. Battle for the lead within teammates. Sorry. And this is Northern Pappas, six. of course, who got by Luis Diaz when he came back out. And they're currently down in fourth and fifth. Pappas holds the higher ground. Because of the pit stops, of yeah. course, we're talking. And that's going to shake out here shortly. Now look, that was a good move right there. Trying to go cut to the outside to the inside to get a run on the straightaway. And lap traffic didn't make it work. Though. Inside 30 laps. In fact, we're fast approaching 20 laps to go. And Luis Diaz putting the pressure on Max Pappas. The 0-1 car has spent the majority of this race in the lead. Wonder if uh, Chip Ganassi's got any radio <laughs> talk going on right now as to who's supposed to be doing what to who. Of course, Chip and Ooh, the entire Ganassi organization here this weekend, the Rolex Sports Car Series, sharing the facility with the IRL IndyCar Series. So. The entire Ganassi squad are here as they come past the Doncaster Porsche. Jean-Francois Dumoulin, slick move there from Pappas and Diaz. Good move right there. You know what happened? Matt Max came off turn one and he hit the bump, he hit the curb. And here now with 27 finally making his pit stop and we're going to see what he does. We know this needs to be fast, Calvin Fish. Absolutely. With Kevin Durant managed to stretch that fuel mileage about four or five laps more than the O2 car, that means this fuel stop should be quicker. Let's wait and see what the team does. Magnussen brings it in, hits the marks perfectly. Selects so first gear. No one's going to the cockpit. They're going to right side tires. Nothing looking like it's going to happen on the left side. A little bit of a delay there on the right rear. Tires being bolted up, and then we're going to look at the fuel. Let's see if this is a time stop. Kevin Durant's got his stopwatch. They're cleaning out the radiator grill, and they're going to look at the O2. A little bit more fuel needed. Everything's done with the service of the car. Kevin's got the stick in his hand, agonizing weight here for Jan Magnussen. And there he goes. He leans over the wall, taps the fuel. Let's go down to Brian. Right behind you, Calvin, is the 81 car. They roll it to a stop. They're going to take tires this time, and it will be timed fuel stop only. A lot of damage to the right front of this car when you look at it. Amazing that it has been able to run this fast. These cars seem like tanks. As a matter of fact, the biggest problem that we've seen in contact seems to be blown tires. They're having a little bit of a problem here with the right front, and this will create a problem because it's a time stop for fuel. They will not take a full load on, and he cannot get the right front lug nut off. Finally, it comes off, and this is going to be a problem if they cannot get it back on. Don't know if it's a problem with pressure on the gun or not. They're going to take four tires, which makes it even worse. They're finished with the fuel, and now it's tires, and this is going to be painful, and it's going to hold them up. In addition, it looks like the car has stopped very close to the wall, making it difficult for the guys on the left side of the car to get the tires on. Very disappointing after the run that they've had here, Lee. Oh, that was agonizing, absolutely agonizing for the GMW boys and Kelly Collins. And I can tell you that Magnussen did not beat the two Ganassi cars out. Pappas and Diaz went flying by down the main straight just as the Doran was released. So the Ganassi pair will have the upper hand on the Doran list of pilot Jan Magnussen. This race is anybody's. Stay with us. The Grand Prix of Miami will continue on the other side of this break. Back at Homestead, and the action is on, and it's on between teammates. On the timing monitor, Andy Wallace leads the race officially, but we know he has to come in and pit again. So it's on between these two guys, the Italian, the Mexican, and they are hard at it. Diaz, while we were away in that break, come on the inside through NASCAR 4, really put the pressure on Mad Max. Now look at this, the young Mexican's really working Max over. Max throws a block on his own teammate, goes defensive, and he's got braking problems. Two corners in a row now, the 0-1. There, he's definitely got a problem at the back of that car. It's twitching around like crazy. I think the pass is going to be made at this next corner. Something wrong with the 0-1 under braking. Watch here. Diaz thinks about it on the inside, and again, the 0-1 gets loose under brakes. Yeah, it's really, really ugly at the back right now. Matt, Matt's doing the best he can to hold on to it, but it's a matter of time, in my opinion. The Comp USA Lexus powered Rileys. And look at this, Pappas on the right of your screen. Diaz goes high and goes into the lead. Now, can Max respond here? You're right with Pappas on the inside. Now, if I'm, if I, if I'm Diaz, I know that that car cannot break as good as I can. He might be on the inside of me, but I'm going to drive him deep into turn one. I mean, real deep. And he's doing that right now. 
right around the outside. You're looking at it, you're right with Pappas. Diaz, does he have enough breaks? Max is going to make it hard for him, but Diaz <laughs> goes into the lead. And a boy, that's the way to do it. Great driving, Luis Diaz. Fantastic stuff for this guy in his first race. Let's hear from the man who owns this team, the main man, Chip Ganassi. Chip, that just kind of answered my question. I was going to ask you if there are team in, any team orders, but it looks like they're not. Brian, there's never been team orders in our team. There never will be. Great racing out there. What do you tell the guys when they go out there? Just race hard, but don't touch each other? Oh, that was close. <laughs> yeah, don't hit each other. I think he's the most interested uh, spectator that's out here, Lee. Oh, this is... <laughs> that was very close. I'll tell you what, Diaz, I, I was about to make the comment that I think he'll just stretch the lead right now. I think he'll he'll take off. We see flags in this area, and it's a car slow. There it is off the road. I saw a yellow and white flag. Slow disabled vehicle. Diaz should be able to pull away. He's got a lot more car right now. And at this moment, don't discount Jan Magnussen. Last time round, Magnussen did a 116 flat. That was the, uh, Pappas was in the 18s. Diaz was in the 17s. So Magnussen, although he only took two fresh tires, he is flying at the moment. And he's only about four seconds behind Max Pappas. Calvin, what do you have? Well, Andy Wallace, the current leader, as we suspected, is making his way down pit road. And we expect this to be an extremely fast stop now. Just going to be a splash of fuel. They got tires at hand, some scrub tires, but they may not need them. Difficult for Andy again to his pit box there. The Maserati car right behind him on pit lane. They look like they're going to front tires only. And we talk about the balance of the car, different tire combinations by all these teams. So there's really a good strategy involved here and what you need to do under these very difficult conditions. Hot conditions today. We haven't seen ambient temperatures or track temperatures like this all week long. That's a big juggle, a big guessing game for this team. Waiting for the fuel fueling done. One tire's only Andy Wallace back underway. Lots of talk about the driver pairing in this car with Milka Duno and Andy Wallace. A vast difference in the level of experience in terms of the level of motorsport that Andy has done in comparison to Milka. But she didn't do too bad in the opening stint of this race. So much so Andy should finish in the top five in this one. She did exactly what I'm sure Andy told her to do, which is go out there, do the best you can, try to stay out of trouble, bring me a good car, let me do the sprint race at the end. The 16, the Asco Motorsports car still, and has been for the majority of the race, the SGS class leading car. Chris. Well, we def we've definitely got a nail biter with the DPs, but we've also got a nail biter back here in SGS, the 16. Craig Stent is still leading David Murray in the 36, but both teams did one fuel stop, and they're gonna try and make it go to the end. They've been working on their calculators. They've been scratching away with their pencils. They think they might run out of fuel, but they can't come into pit lane because they definitely won't will if they win if they do that. So they're going to stay out until they get a little fuel bottle or they're going to get the checker flag. There's only five seconds separating the top three cars at the front of this field. Diaz, Pappas, Magnussen. It could be a Lexus lockout on the podium overall. That's the way they sit. What oh. does Magnussen have? We've got the 06, the ICY car, on the side of the track, is yeah. that enough? Is that in a precarious enough, enough position? It's not to bring really. Out the caution? It's not in a terrible position because it's down on the bottom. But you always have to question whether bring, they bring out this yellow or not. And if they do, think about Andy Wallace. And the yellow has just now come out in front of me. Wow! I was just saying about Andy Wallace. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Second full course caution of the day. Now we're going to have a race on our hands. <laughs> oh, 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 this one you thought it was getting good. Within 20 laps of the finish, and wow. the 06 comes to a halt. A combination of Steve Leeser and David Rosenblum. David behind the wheel, and for only the second time in 92 laps, the caution comes out and will pack this field together. And Jan Magnussen says, Thank you very much. I was four seconds down. And now you've made my task a whole lot easier. The Daytona prototype class and overall looks like this. It's Diaz, Pappas and Magnussen ahead of Hurley Hayward and Andy Wallace. It's still Bill Orblin and Joey Hand, a BMW PTG 1-2 in GT. Still under caution here at Homestead Miami Speedway and several teams and cars making the most of that second caution to come in for their final stop of the day. We work our way back to green flag racing 
And here we go, it is on, and we've got the top three in the race all together. It's Diaz, Pappas, and Jan Magnus, and look at Max Pappas! Almost hits his teammate, hard on the brakes, down into one. Had no oh, oh no, he's the gone! Road. Diaz is gone! Can you believe it? Whilst in the lead, he has thrown it away off to the side of the track, and Pappas inherits the lead. Unforced air did it all by himself. Nobody punted him, that was just a mistake. And now that takes him out of the equation. Now it's a big race up front here. And he's stuck on the outside of the racetrack, not being able to get it fired yet, it looks like. And to add insult to injury, he has been given a drive-through penalty as well uh, for passing the pace car. Well, I saw that and I didn't want to say anything, but he jumped on it too soon and got past the pace car before the green came out, so... Well, that, that's not good. Look at this. Two of the most high-profile high drivers in this field, two of the most experienced guys in this field, and they're battling for the lead. It's Ganassi versus Doran. Both Lexus power plants in this car, but the lead is a Riley chassis. The second is a Doran chassis. Angelelli is packed in behind, but he is not on the lead lap. He is back in eighth. Here's the replay. Gets in down on the flat, just drives in too deep. Tires are too cold. He used the same brake mark as he had been. Too much speed off the outside. He goes, takes him out of the equation. Of course, he's still not back underway there. The rest of the field goes on safely. Here's another look at it. Just too much speed. He can't get it off the outside. Just couldn't get it turned in. Luis Diaz, just when he had done so much good, throws it away. This is on board with Pappas. Yeah, Pappas knows right here he's in trouble. He knows already. Ugh, and gets clouded with all the debris. Now Max has to defend. And, well, look at this. Angelelli has got past Magnussen. But remember, that's not a position. And we've got another full course caution. Yeah, and that is probably going to pick that. Now, Angelelli, you know, trying to get a lap back. But... That's the lead there you're talking about, and that's the reason for the caution. Young Mr. Diaz off the outside of the road won't be fired. So it's not over yet. No, not by a long shot. Oh, big damage to the nose here. Look at all the damage right in there. It's going to be more than just uh, more than just a pull out of the ditch. Let's get it to the pits. Brian Till. Jimmy Morales, you guys, what a great job. The highs are so high and the lows so low. I know standing here watching the car in the lead had to feel good. But how does it feel now after you've seen the mistake that Luis has made? Well, uh, remember that Luis uh, don't have the, enough experience. He's a new driver. Uh, we have uh, pushed him all through his career. We know he has the talent to do it. He has shown that talent. He just needs to get a little bit more experience, and we're going to do it. And the racing here in this series, especially as competitive as it has gotten, it has to be tremendously exciting. But how difficult is the traffic that we've seen? Well, so far, uh, everybody have uh, uh, be very honest uh, and don't cut so much uh, through us. But, uh, you know, it's uh, very hard work, especially for drivers that young like Luis, that he just have to have a seat time on the car and be aware and accustomed to this type of racing. But I feel proud of my teammate that he have done an extremely good job, and I feel very proud about all the team effort that we have get from Chip Ganassi. Well, what a great job to have a teammate like this, who, even though he says he's not a little bit angry, you know it's got to break his heart to see that race thrown away, but they'll be back, guys, these strong drivers, strong team, Lee. We're coming to the restart, and Magnuson could not wait. We've got 10 laps to go. This is a sprint to the checkered flag. Watch the wall, here he comes, he spits the Porsches. He's now a third place card prototype. This is where Luis Diaz made the error. These two guys, too experienced to do something like that. They know better to take it easy on that restart. So it's Max Pappas leads Jan Magnussen. The third car in shot is the SunTrust. Riley and Max Angelelli are one lap down and is trying desperately to get back on the lead lap. Then there's your third place car. Andy Wallace is not out of this yet. Now if Wallace can catch Angelelli, Angelelli should let him by, but I don't think that's going to happen. He hasn't caught him yet either. Alexis Riley from Alexis Doran. The Pontiac Riley, Max Angelelli. And then the Pontiac Howard Crawford of Andy Wallace. The final 10 laps here at Homestead Miami Speedway. There was a great build up to this event. A lot of anticipation, a lot of excitement. Simply for the fact that there was 18 Daytona prototypes. Everyone said we we're expecting a great race, and it has been an exciting and an eventful race. And it's not over by any means when they're going to have nine to go when they come through the line. You look right now, Mad Max doing everything to try to shake his pursuer. 
The reason why Jan Magnussen has ended up in this car with Didier Tays, the 2002 SRP champion in the Rolex Sports Car Series. Freddie Leinhardt, oh, Pappas gets sideways. Magnussen pounces. He sticks it on the inside and he's through. There was, may have been contact yeah, there. They, they definitely got together. It's really tight right there. Pappas responds. Magnussen made the big move on the inside. Angelelli's got his lap back. Now that's out of the way. Here comes Andy Wallace to make it three. So one, two, and three. The top three in this race are all together now. It is a fair fight. A lot of smoke there coming out of one of those cars. It might have just be braking. I know they're demonic in the brake zones this lap. These two guys could take each other out, and Andy yeah. Wallace could say thanks, boys. <laughs> That's exactly right. Here comes Magnuson. Look on the inside. Yeah, Block there. There's some hard braking going on here. Pappas versus Magnuson. Wallace just very, very sensibly sitting back and watching what these guys are up to and realizing oh, there's he is a still in with a shot, but Pappas has got problems. And I think that could be a retire rub. Oh, no, I see. I don't think it is. I don't see any mark on the side. It's getting worse. As he gets into the banking, Magnuson hangs back just a little. And that could be as Chip Ganassi looks on. He's already lost one car. Can he lose another? Both of them while in the lead. Now, it only smoked on the banking there, so maybe it is tire rub. They definitely got together over there to turn, to turn three. See what it does here. Let's have a look at the replay. This is where, on the previous lap, Jan Magnuson made that desperado move. There's the trouble. Get sideways just a little bit. Up the inside, but it's very tight here. It's a hairpin right here. Right there, I think they did, in fact, touch. Andrew Lally gets by clean. Now, is that enough of a problem to uh, another look here? See that little wiggle just up the back end? Was that all it took. Back there, though? Here's where it's going to happen right here. Right there. And you know what happened right there? <laughs> if Magnuson got a TV, he couldn't make the next corner. Now, oh, look now at Pappas defense. Yeah, now, we're, now we're getting the wide car out. We're counting Not down the happen. chicken flag. Magnuson almost contact. Oh, big there contact. Go. Do do. We go side by side. These guys are driving each other off the road. Pappas oh, and Magnuson, bang. they bash. They continue to bash. Boy, oh, boy, we saw the 27 in this last year with David Donahue, but it was Taze at the wheel. Now Magnuson and Pappas are giving it to each other. Now you got to watch knocking the valve stems off because they're going to both have flat tires here. And their top speed hit. That's oh. stupid. <laughs> That's just a little bit too much. I, I would think they need a reprimand. The this door's, is going to end There's a wreck. and it has. Both of boy, them. Boy, oh boy. And our man Wallace goes to the lead. That's like what they deserve. Both of them deserve to be right where they are. That was wild stuff on the track. They need a reprimand there. I'm just telling you, that, that's just a little too much. That's dangerous at 180 miles an hour if you're playing that game. That is wild racing. And you were riding with Max Pappas when they hit at well over 150 miles an hour. Now Pappas's door is open. We knew there was going to be contact. We knew there was going to be contact in this one, but nothing like that. And the smartest guy is going to win this race. Wallace will get the victory that he didn't get at the Rolex 24 if he can just hang in there. He has inherited the lead by these two guys' aggressiveness. Well, a little is one thing and a lot's another, and uh, they paid the ultimate price for it. Neither of these guys will win today. Plus, they get to go back to their team owners and explain why did you tear my car up like that? <laughs> boy, oh boy, knowing Chip Ganassi, he is not oh, going to no. be impressed. I wouldn't want to go back and see the boss. Let's have a look at some replays, a succession of replays. This was serious stuff. Yeah, that, that is a big monster hit, and it's at the fastest place of the whole racetrack. There, there's your payback. Take that. Now we're both going off. Neither of us going to win. Let's give it to Andy. Wow. Lucky that wasn't a much bigger wreck. Look at this. Here's the big hit. Here's the big hit. We were oh, right there. You were riding with Max Pappas when we had the onboard shot. And I'm not sure that Magnuson could pull that now, car up. Neither of these guys can even start to say this was an accident. Listen Let's go on board again. You heard that savage replay. Now let's hear from the boss. Chip, I know you've run cars in just about every class, and we've seen this kind of stuff in cup racing, but you never expect to see it in sports car racing. Any idea what's going on out there? You know, Max comes on the radio. He says, hey, this guy's destroying our car. What is, what's he doing? What's he doing? I don't know who's driving a 27 car, but the guy thinks it's a weapon, not a car. 
Well, you heard it from Chip Ganassi. Let's get down to Calvin Fish. Well, I'm not brave enough to interview Kevin Duran, but I'll talk to DDA teammate with Jan Magnussen. DDA, your recent speed is 170 mile an hour plus there. That's some game those boys are playing out there on the front straightaway. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, don't, I didn't see what happened on the back there. I just saw some smoke, probably the tires touching the bodywork. That's all I saw on the front straightaway. I don't know what happened. Kevin Durant's reaction, he took his headset and threw it. It went about 50 yards, guys. Unbelievable. I've never seen anything like no. that. That yeah. was wild. And I tell you, when they get done talking to Ganassi, when they get done talking to Kevin Durant, there's going to be another man down there they're going to have to talk to. I guarantee you that. And guess what? With all of that going on, we have already mentioned the fact that Andy Wallace has inherited the lead. Two of the new Daytona prototypes in this field. That is, and there is Jan Magnussen. Acknowledging the crowd, <laughs> but uh, Kelly Collins is in second and Bert Frizzell is in third. And Hurley Hayward has moved up to fourth. We ride with our new race leader, and in their first race together, Milka Duno and Andy Wallace should win. There is just five laps to go here at Homestead. What a race! It was billed as a good one, but none of us expected anything like that. Stay with us. When we return, we'll take you to the checkered flag. Four laps to go. You rejoin us here at Homestead, and you look at the race leader, the Sitco Crawford, the Pontiac Power Plant, and there's Jan Magnussen. Long walk back to the pits. I think you should stay on that side of the fence. Oh, I wouldn't want to go back down there right now. It's going to be pretty interesting, too, when Chip Ganassi and Kevin Doran get Ooh. together as well. Ooh. My goodness. That's ugly. But let's get back and focus on the positive, because for Wallace, who drove extremely well with Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Tony Stewart at the Rolex 24, remember, if you didn't see it, they got within 17 minutes of the checkered flag in a 24-hour race and heartbreak for everybody involved at Howard Boss Motorsports with a suspension failure and the car hit the wall. But let's relive those scary moments. second time we've given you that re replay real time and listening to the natural sound and we will follow this story up at the end of the race but getting back to the issue at hand well it looked like being Lexus one two and three on the podium now not a chance Andy Wallace in the Pontiac Howard Crawford leads the way and leads by over five seconds over Kelly Collins in the new GW Motorsports RX.com car there's Milka Duno She's poised to get her first win in Daytona prototypes in only her second race in a DP. You can't take anything away from what Milka did. Look at that race car. There is not a mark on it. She didn't bash the pen anything. She didn't knock it down straight away. She gave it to Andy Wallace. Look who's going to win the race. And Max Crawford, when he spoke to Calvin earlier, disappointment in Max's voice again. He said, no, nah, it just didn't go our way. We tried to get Milka on that, you know, to the end of her first tank. And didn't work out. But never mind, we've had a good run anyway. Well, it's gone from good to great because Wallace and Duno if they can hang in there for just a few more laps, we'll succeed in round two. This team deserves a payback for the heartbreak Do they want? Of, yeah. of Daytona. I mean, they were the class of the field. They did the best job. It all fell apart right at the end. Come on, Andy, bring it home. Sitco is a new sponsor to the Rolex Sports Car Series. They will be thrilled. It's a big sponsor. This class of track some really nice sponsors. We see them every week. Every week we get more cars and we get more sponsors. That's a great sign. Why? Look at this racing. Fantastic. Let's just give you a quick rundown of the closing stages of this one. We know that Wallace is leading from Kelly Collins and Bert Frizzell. Then it's the Brumos Porsche of Hurley Hayward. Max Angelelli for some trust. Never give up. And that is a great saying because he's come up to fifth. Overall, Borchella has come up to sixth. Papa's still running as in, and is in seventh, ahead of the Prasowskis in the Essex Racing Multimatic. Then Jack Baldwin in ninth. And Larry Huang and Chris Hall have come up inside the top ten. Top two in GT, and it is the Team PTG BMW boys. And out in front, it is the 22. Rather, I should say the 21 of Bill Orbler. He's actually coming around to put a lap on the 22 of Joey Hand. Regardless, they will finish 1-2 at this rate. No need for him to pass now. I mean, there's 
There's no point in it. And white flag is out for Andy Wallace, the British driver who's won all the big sports car races. The Rolex 24, he's won Sebring, he's won the Le Mans 24 hour in France. But this one he will save it, that's for sure, because that incredible heartbreak at the Daytona 24 hour a month ago. And this will help erase those memories. What about these guys though? From last to the class lead in SGS, Dave Murray and Craig Stanton, that'll help erase their bad memories of the Rolex 24 as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's another team speaking of that. Really deserves a, a good finish. And on the final lap, we shouldn't forget that Kelly Collins is really closing the gap rapidly on Andy Wallace. It's down to two and a half seconds there. First to second. The pressure is still on for Andy, but he's almost home. And Bill Caduno hanging on because she almost is there to the checkered flag with her teammate Andy Wallace for victory in the Grand Prix of Miami. Well, there he is. Not much of a gap right now. I don't know if Andy's just playing at Coy, knowing him he is. Been a teammate of mine, he's very smart. Coming around for the final two turns, NASCAR three, NASCAR four. He was denied by 17 minutes in Daytona. He won't be denied today. Andy Wallace and Bill Caduno win the Grand Prix of Miami. And a payback there for Max Crawford and the entire Howard Boss Motorsports team. Well done to Bill Caduno. Well done, Andy Wallace. Terrific drive. The other two guys took themselves out in spectacular fashion. And Andy was there to pick up the pieces. <laughs> what did the army? 1.9 seconds, the margin of victory over the GMW Motorsports DP. Well done, Kelly Collins and, and uh, Court Wagner. But here's first and second in the GT class. Tom Milner will be very pleased with his boys. They've driven a sensible race, and they'll come across the line with a formation finish. And once again, vindication for a terrible Daytona. This team just had a horrible time there. All three classes rectifying or making them men's of, of what happened at Daytona. Fantastic race here today. Well, Dorsey, you said it's a completely different kettle of fish, isn't it? The 24 compared to this, which is a sprint race, and we've seen completely different winners so far in the top two classes. As they come across the line, the PTG boys, congratulations to those guys. BMW 1 and 2 in the GT class. And I know that Milner's men will be thrilled with that. And the 16, the Asco Motorsports car of Craig Standen and Dave Murray poised to take victory in that class as well. As usual, when we return from the break, we will wrap it up. There is still so much to talk about from Homestead. Stay with us. It's a battle-scarred Comp USA Daytona prototype for Chip Ganassi Racing. But uh, while Andy Wallace and Milka Duno won this race, this will be the most talked about incident. This car in the 27 and the collisions, the multiple collisions and contacts between it and the 27. Jan Magnussen and Max Pappas were going hard at it. Magnussen put an early move on Pappas, then Pappas switched back. Then there was tire rubbing there between those two guys, then contact. Magnussen went off the track. They were relentless. Neither wanted to give in. It ended like this, but in between, there was plenty of contact between Pappas and Magnussen at scary speeds like that at 170 miles an hour, smashing each other to smithereens. And that's how it came to an end. The in-car was incredible. Take a look at this, the impact, the contact. Papa shaking his head. He kept going. He wanted to take it into turn one. And that's where it finished. We should add that Pappas did finish the race in seventh. And he's without Brian till right now. Well, Chip Ganassi with Felix Sabata. Show what they can do in sports car racing. Maybe only fitting, Max, that we're here on a racetrack that has part of an oval on it because it looked like a Nextel Cup short track race. But you're all smiles. First of all, you're okay. Absolutely. You know, it was uh, just an amazing race, you know. We, for our first time, uh, you know, actually running a dry race was awesome. Everybody at Chip Ganassi Racing have done a tremendous job. We raced really, really hard. You know, I was expecting uh, to you know, bang wheels, but not in this way. You know, we're going to do the next one, but uh, it was a lot of fun. Well, from your point of view, I mean, what actually got all that melee started? Uh, I got to have to watch it. You know, it was uh, so much, you know, banging and shuffling, you know, that, uh, you know, the, my door got open and we got spun around. You know, it was... Uh, you know, very, very close racing. <laughs> well, one of the first guys down here to congratulate him was Boris said Boris doing a fair amount of uh, cup racing himself. Give him a big congratulations and 
Max watching it on the big screen, all smiles, Lee. What a day. <laughs> Torsi and I are still flabbergasted up here. Sensational stuff. We had three new qualifying records, and we've ended up with three different class winners here in Homestead, and we will hear from those winners when we return. Welcome back to a very happy victory lane. Andy Wallace Rest, Milka Duno, his co-driver. Milka, what a performance today. You did a great job there in the opening stint. Yes, everything was perfect. We concentrate and go, 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 go. Don't make a mistake. And we finish in the podium. <laughs> what a day. And Andy, after the disappointment of the 24 hour, you got some payback here tonight. It just goes to show, you know, motor racing, you never know who's going to win, do you? I thought at the Daytona we had it in the bag, but you never should think things like that. This was fantastic. Very happy for Mika because she's not experienced with this kind of car. She did a great job. The whole team did such a great job. You know when we stopped every time? Clockwork. The radio work was fantastic. I thought we struggled a bit uh, midweek with the balance of the car, but it just came good on race day. I love this place. <laughs> and, and talk uh, about that battle in front of you with Max and uh, Jan going at it. You had a bird's eye view there. Yeah, it's brilliant. I just love it. You know, I mean, you guys in the grandstand had a, had a great race to watch. I had a better one to watch. It was great from where I was sitting. But thanks to Grand Dam and the Rolex Series, thanks for Sitco for putting us here, thanks for Crawford because they did a great job to build this car. When's the next one? <laughs> Coming up, mate, we'll see you in Phoenix. Congratulations to the both of you, well done. Wonderful stuff from Andy Wallace and Milka Duno. And just saw in the background there, Catherine Crawford, who is Andy Wallace's fiance, and she was in charge of the aerodynamics on this car, working with her mum. Jan Crawford and Father Max. It's a real family effort here. Two very special girls in that team. It's a day for the girls, no doubt about that. Yeah, and well-deserved at that. Um, I tell you what, I think this is the first overall major win for a female driver. Well-deserved win. Yeah, great day, and that's given her a lot of confidence. Let's take a look at the results of round two of the Rolex series. And you see there, Wallace and Duno. What about the performance for GMW Motorsports in, uh, with Port Wagner and Kelly Collins. Brent Martini will be dying to get into that car, hopefully at the next round at Phoenix. And there you see Frizzell and Negri, their first race in Daytona prototypes in that car, and they finish on the podium. Wonderful effort from them. And Hurley Hayward and JC France never say die. They didn't give up. Angelelli Taylor finishing in the top 10. And P Pappas and Pruitt, they held in there to finish in seventh in points behind Terry Borcella and Forrest Barber. We work our way back, we pick up in 12th position, the top GT finishing car there of Boris Said and Bill Orblin. Good result too for Mike Borkowski and Paul Mears finishing just outside the top 10 in their Mears Motor Coach Daytona prototype. 1-2 for PTG BMW and top SGS car finishing 15th overall out of 42. Not a bad effort. Great effort. Look at these, these guys filling out the field in the back here. I'm so impressed with this series and you can't say that Raleigh doesn't build a strong car. Man, oh man, that was some bashing. We work our way back towards 42. You see, you see there in 40th position, another tough hand dealt to Darren Law and David Donahue after that hard contact earlier. It affected their suspension, and they were out of it and finishing in 35th. Diaz and Morales. That is not indicative of how well they went today. And continuing problems for Stefan Gregoire and Doug Goat, but they were strong early on. And we look forward to the next round in Phoenix, and so too do they. Do they to get up in the top 10 yet again like they were at the Rolex 24. We've still got more to come from Homestead. Stay with us. Beautiful sunset here over Homestead Miami Speedway and what a day of racing we have had. Time to hear from another class winner. Chris is with the SGS class winners. Thanks, Lee. Down here with David Murray. David, real tough start to the weekend. You went out, you grabbed the pole, but then you got the technical infraction. They put you in the back. Before we were halfway through the race, you were back in the lead. You and came through that pack like a bullet. Stage. Tell us about that opening stint. It was pretty hard, actually. It seemed like it was all right, but, you know, starting morning. the back, you got to be very careful because I've had instances before you even going off line and you pick up something and a flat tire. So I had to be careful with all that stuff, making sure there's no contact. I knew it was a long race, but I couldn't wait either. I wanted to get out. If I could get a, in the lead and then pull a gap, then hopefully the pace, the, the lead car would be in the right spot now when they had a the yellow and put us a lap up. And that's exactly what happened. We we're fortunate for that. We got a lap up, but then Pontiac the 36 power. car was so strong, uh, you know, they were catching us. Our car had a little understeer, and Craig Stanton's my hero because he he was the one that was really working hard to keep it he keep it out of the head. So, you know, it was a tough stint. The Osco guys, they worked the hard for three months. We had a lot of incidents at Daytona. Came up short, didn't have a chance to really run down and get the points we wanted to at Daytona, but you know, it's all coming home now, and it sure is a, a worthwhile for the guys. Hey, Craig, in that last stint that you had, 
Randy Popes was really charging hard there at the end. You came Hello, in, you got rear tires. Is that what now. made it for you? You know what? Strategy made it for us. We got pretty lucky with the yellows. Uh, yeah, Randy, does, the whole team of theirs does a great job. Randy's a good driver. They've got a great setup. They've been living this type of racing for years. They've got it figured out. I want to say thanks Welcome to all the Speed Pontiac. Speed TV people. and um, it just, It's just a great day for Oscar Porsche. And all the team did a great job. Back at Homestead, Miami Speedway, and what an incident packed day, a very exciting day of sports car racing. And there was one young man who thought he was about to taste victory until this. Luis Diaz was putting in a wonderful drive. Before this, contact between Jan Magnussen and Max Pappas. This will be the most talked about incident of the race. It overshadowed Diaz's spin whilst leading and going off the track at the restart. Wait for this. Whoa! Massive contact between these guys. And then the final hit down in turn one, which sent Max Pappas and Jan Magnussen spinning. It terminated Magnussen's day, but Pappas was able to continue and finish in the top 10 in seventh. A wild, wild ride. We mentioned earlier about Luis Diaz. Let's hear from him now. First sports car race, you put on one heck of a show. I mean, you showed what you were made of. We saw the little mistake, but from your point of view, tell us what happened on that restart. Well, I came to race very hard. Uh, it's been a great chance for uh, for me to be part of Chip Ganassi. So I wanted to race hard, and unfortunately, I don't have enough experience in this series, but I learned from this lesson, and it will not happen again, and I will come next race uh, a lot stronger. Well, I have seen you a lot in the past, and I know when you make a mistake, you learn from it, and you don't make that mistake again. What did you learn today, especially about traffic that you can take on in the next event? Well, you have to. to uh, I will timing better my my uh, to to pass a car, and I learned a lot. I mean, it's very different than what I'm used to race, and we did it very well. I mean, I'm very proud of the, of the guys of the entire Chip Ganassi uh, group, uh, of my sponsors, Compute USA, Good Guys Helmix. And next time you will see we're, we're, we're going to be there. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of the race highlights because it was a marvelous day of racing. At the start, 18 Daytona prototypes, 42 cars in total, took the flag and it was Scott Pruitt, the second consecutive pole sitter, led, led the way. Forrest Barber spun and made contact on the first lap with the wall. That put him a lap down. Eventually major contact there between several cars and Court Wagner and the Chip uh, Vance Stevenson car was damaged as well. The, the uh, Silverstone car spun. The first caution of the day was due to the Nonamaker's Planet Earth car. And then there was an agonizing penalty for the 44 Orbit Porsche, the Rolex 24 car. The Michael Shank Lexus Doran had an outstanding day and finished on the podium. At the restart, there was plenty of action. And the 27 Doran listed Daytona prototype was one of the big movers of the day. Milka Duno did everything she was asked to do and handed it over to Andy Wallace, second portion of the day, due to the ICY Corvette. Then we get back to it. Luis Diaz, poised for a victory, ran off the circuit. That was day done. Then it was action time. Fight on, put the gloves on, because it was on between Magnussen and Pappas, big style, like we have never seen in Daytona prototypes before. It was action of plenty and pretty scary stuff, to be honest. And the man who sat back to take the victory, Andy Wallace and Milka Duno, wonderful performance for them and the entire Howard Boss Sitco team and the Crawford cars finally get their first victory in DPs. Wonderful achievement for those pair, that's for sure. Let's hear from our class-winning GT pair. Well, we're down here with the winning PTG BMW team, Billy. Great way to come back from the disappointment of Daytona. Yeah, Daytona was not what we are all about. This is what we are all about. Team PTG, Tom Milner, Boris said did an awesome job in the beginning as always. I think this is gonna be like what you're gonna see all year. This is my prediction. You know, at home I just wanna say, I never say hello to my mom, my mom, my dad, my wife. How you doing? Good job, mate. And Boris starting from the pole, but that racers group with Ian James behind the wheel gave you a good battle there in the opening laps. Yeah, it was good fun, I mean, uh Racing close is what, what makes racing fun, and the BMW was great today. Performance friction gave us some new brakes and rotors and calipers made a big difference. So I uh, just want to say, I've always wanted to say hi to my son. I've never had one, but now I have one. So I got to say hi to Boris Jr. at home. 
my friends at No Fear and uh, New Century Mortgage, the best damn mortgage company. Well, Dorsey, we haven't heard from you for a while. Thoughts on today? You were jumping up here in the booth when the, when Magnuson and Pappas were hitting each other. It was an amazing day, no question about it. I'm, I'm right with Andy Wallace. When's the next one? You know, Phoenix coming up. I can't wait to get to. They put on a whale of a show today. Uh, there, as good as I've ever seen. There's the SGS podium. Let's uh, pay credit to Andy Lally and Mark Bunting just walking away. There's Randy Popes and Mike Levitus, and of course the winners, Craig Stanton and Dave Murray, standing tall for Arsco Motorsports. Let's take a look at our SunTrust biggest movers. Each of the guys in class who voted on for the best move of the race and they get some extra cash bonus. So you see right here of each class who, who gets the recipient of that money. That's always good money too at the end of the day. You, you forget about it when you're racing but that extra yeah. shell out of some cash, you know, that's good. And look at how many positions, uh, you know, the Howard Boss car, Andy Wallace and Milko Duno moved up 14 positions to take SunTrust's biggest movers in the uh, Daytona prototype class. Michael Boffman Racing got the cash there as well in GT and the Scuderia Ferrari of Washington team in SGS. Did you like this one? I love this one. I give some advice to the chassis builders. Start building more chassis, you're going to need them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It was an exciting day here in Southern Florida on behalf of Chris Neville, Brian Till, Calvin Fish, Dorsey Schrader. I'm Lee Diffie. And Thanks on behalf of the entire speed team for watching this. Wow, the Rolex series is ramping up.